Audio test. This is an audio test to the live stream. Checking audio test to the live stream. This is the Long Beach Community College District Board of Trustees meeting. October 19, 1976. Audio test. This is an audio test to the live stream. Audio test to the live stream, Long Beach Community College District, Board of Trustees meeting.
We'll call the meeting to order. Uh, this is the Wednesday, October 19th, 2022, regular board and meeting of the Long Beach Community College District Board of Trustees. Welcome everyone this evening. We're gonna go to item 1.1, uh, roll call of the trustees. Uh, and we do have uh, Tr Vice President Chico uh, participating remote today. But Secretary Reese, can we do a roll call vote please? I mean, ro uh, a roll call <laughs> attendance. Virginia Baxter. Here. Herlinda Chico. Present. Vivian Malaulu. Here. Uduak Joe Inta. Here. Sunny Zia. Here. All right, we have a quorum of the board. Moving to item uh, 1.3, public comment on closed session agenda items. This is an opportunity for the public to speak for up to three minutes on a, a per speaker and up to 20 minutes per subject. Do we have any speaker cards? No comments received. Okay, no public comments tonight. Uh, with that, we will adjourn into closed session uh, for three or four items, and then we will be back out in approximately an hour. Thank you, everybody. See you shortly.
call this meeting to order. If we can have people please take their seats. We are reconvening from closed session back into open session. Welcome to the Long Beach Community College District Board of Trustees regular meeting for October 19, 2022. We are at item 2.1 reconvening, call to order. We're gonna to move to item 2.2, which is our Pledge of Allegiance. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Della Torre if she can lead us tonight. Sonia? Everyone, please, please stand. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Moving to item 2.3, land acknowledgement. Uh, the Long Beach Community College acknowledges our presence on traditional ancestral land of the Gabrielino Tungva peoples. This land remains unceded territory. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory. Long Beach City College honors and respects the Gabrielino Tungva ancestors and their connection to this land today. Moving to item 2.4 is roll call. I ask for Secretary Reese to take a roll call of the trustees. Virginia Baxter. Here. Herlinda Chico. Vice President Chico, can you hear us? I can, I'm present. Vivian Malaulu. Here. Uduakjo Intuk. Here. Sunny Zia. Here. And student trustee Hernandez. Here. All right, we have a quorum of the trustees. We do have uh, Vice President Chico participating remotely uh, via phone. Uh, and then we also have Board Council Ewing is re participating remotely via phone. Moving to item 2.5, report out of closed session. We have no reportable action this evening, uh, but we do have one uh, item. If we go back in the agenda. We missed um, public comment on closed session agenda items. I have a Lawrence Boland with a public comment. This is an opportunity for the public to give a three minute public comment uh, and the topic to be no more than 20 minutes, but each speaker is three minutes and we'll have a timer. timer. Mr. Boland. Yes, Mr. President, thank you very much for accommodating me. I'll make this short as possible. I have uh, two issues I'd like to share with you. Uh, the first is the public use of college projection equipment. Um, I was several times re been refused the use of projection equipment during the open sessions of the LBCC Public Board of Trustees meeting. I believe this policy uh, rejection is a gross violation of my or anybody else's uh, First Amendment rights to a free and unfettered speech. Um, why is it, uh, what is so egregious about this issue is that the members of the private lobbying groups at this college are given use of this public equipment, yet the board excludes the public who are the owners of this public entity doesn't match. Uh, next issue, full-time faculty, uh, Fridays off. Uh, Fridays off may be a little strange to you because that word does not appear in the academic calendar or in the uh, scheduled classes or in the contract, doesn't exist. So the problem is that the academic calendar for 2120 lists all the teaching days paid nine hours per day for 177 days or about 1594 hours per academic year per article 10.01.3 of the master agreement. Excuse me. Uh, however, the published ca class schedule for 21-22 shows faculty members not teaching on Fridays and other days. Please request your college internal auditor to solve this conundrum. Possible time card fraud that may lead to a notification of law enforcement. 
Uh, no, this is about the payroll department. The full-time faculty payroll department is only provided computer reports based on hours taught, three hours per day, um, yet it triggers a payment of nine hours of contractual time. Why does it appear that the college is covering up the six hours of non-teaching time, 54% of the day's pay, and what a coincidence that the master agreement fails to mention where this 54% of daily pay is to be completed, on campus, off campus, anywhere the faculty members want it to be? The issue, faculty can walk off campus at noontime and nobody knows where they are, where they're going, what they're doing, yet a public records request that I submitted states that in the last five years, not one faculty member has been disciplined thank you. for not completing any control. Mr. Bone, thank you, that's your three minutes. Thank you for your public comment this night. Thank you so much, your three minutes have expired. We're, we're happy to take a written copy if you wanna present it to the secretary of the board. Thank you so much for being here. We're now moving on to public comment on agenda items. I have one public comment on agenda items uh, 8.21, academic personnel. Uh, Suzanne Engelhart. Hello, welcome. Um, I just noticed something on that agenda item 8.21, academic personnel. It's in reference to Article 11.5.2 through Article 11.5.2. Two, two in our CBA for full-time faculty. And the article states that the following notification process will be utilized for any district stipends of $2,000 or more. And then, it, and on pages four, five, and 10 of that agenda item, there are a total of four different stipends that are $2,000 or above, and I don't believe I have received anything or notification that these went out to, um, went out to all faculty. And I just, I just saw it on the agenda, I wanted to bring it up. Um, and, and that's all, just uh, um, FYI, and we could follow up later, but I saw it on the agenda. I wanted to bring it to everyone's attention. And um, maybe, beginning next week, we could see if there was actually um, something that went out to inform all faculty, and if not, we could correct that. So, thank you. And I didn't get to the agenda till late, so that's why I'm here <laughs> for this one. Thank you so much. President Sec Untuck. Secretary Reese, do we have any other public comments on agenda items? No others for agenda items. Thank you. Uh, before going on, we're moving on to our next. Do you have something on the public comment? Yeah, we, we I typically don't respond to public comment. No, I, no, I'm not no. responding to that. I'm asking a favor, um, and that is, uh, could we hear from the people from non agenda items? You have done that in the past, and I'm just asking I if think that is possible. I think it's appropriate for our address on item 2.8 that's coming up shortly. Okay. On uh, reordering okay. the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving to item 2.7, approval of the minutes of the September 14th, 2022 Board of Trustees meeting. Uh, there's an attached document. This is an action item. We'll need a motion in a second to advance. So move. Second. Motion by Trustee Bacter, second by Trustee Zia. Any discussion of the draft minutes that are attached? Seeing and hearing none, we'll take a voice vote. All those in favor of adopting the minutes say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any extensions? The minutes are adopted. Moving to item 2.8, reordering the agenda. Uh, at this time, Trustee Baxter, do you have a? Yes, um, request? if you would indulge me, uh, President Enduck, um, there are people here to speak on a non-agenda item. And rather than keep them here for the whole meeting, I wish if you would um, allow them to speak now. Yeah. Am I make, do I make a motion? Yeah, I would say make a motion a second. Uh, then we can okay. we can vote on it. So um, I move that um, 
we, the board hear the non-agenda item comments uh, now uh, rather than at the end of the meeting. Second. It's a move to second. And any discussion on the motion on the floor? I do, I do have a, a potential friendly amendment. We do have several um, important resolutions that are just about to come up and some people waiting. If we can do it after section three, which should only be another 15 or 20 minutes. That's fine. Thank would you. Probably be the uh, most appropriate time. Okay. Thank you. Is that that's fine? Acceptable? That's fine with me. Okay. So we'll move. Um, what item number is that? Three point one. Fifteen. It's fifteen point one. So item fifteen point one will now come after uh, three point four. Yep, is that fair? Yes, thank you. All right. We're moving on to 3.1. Welcome our new faculty members. Uh, this is uh, led by um, Veronica Alvarez, Faculty Professional Development Coordinator, attending our new meeting. Uh, attached is the names of our new faculty members. We have 38 in total. Um, their names are listed here, and I know we're going to have a presentation. Um, and this is a, a, a resolution and recognition. Um, and I'll turn it over to Professor Alvarez. Good evening. How are we doing? Hello, buenas noches. So I am super excited to introduce to you. Um, my name is Veronica Alvarez. I'm the Faculty Professional Development Coordinator here for this term. And I want to introduce the amazing uh, 37 Masketeers. Several of the Masketeers are teaching. Um, so they're not here, but there are others that are going to represent. So we're going to um, uh, go through slides. So when I call your name, come on down. And then we can uh, take a picture, yeah? So let's see here. So uh, Liliana Castro, she is in architecture and she's CTE and she is teaching right now. And she was born uh, in El Salvador. Uh, Dr. Julie Grisby, who is also teaching, she's ethnic studies. Um, she, uh, her Dodger walk-up song is They Say I'm Different by Betty Davis. And Andrea Eliasson, uh, today's her birthday, and so she Can is not the, here. the folks to stand when we're going through? Oh, Pardon? they're not here? Oh, they're not here. Oh, okay. Yes, no, oh. they're not here, yeah. Okay, I saw everybody else. They're <laughs> gone, yeah. Uh, then next is... Uh, Hiromi Takahashi, she is in my department of world languages, and she has two cats, and she learned to skateboard during the pandemic, and she's speaking. Uh, Benjamin Pesh, is he here? No, Benjamin Pesh? No. He is also teaching. Uh, he's in psych, and um, his favorite quote is, just do it by some guy. Uh, and then, oh, uh, Allison Birch, she is from library. And she's a hummingbird aficionado. So could we get a round of applause for Allison from the library? And I love her walk-up song for Dodgers is Oye from Sonora Dinamita. Yeah, thank you. And then we have C. Chow from Psychology. And uh, she's a digital illustrator. And she's a regular consumer of milk and boba tea. Aplauso for There we have uh, Sarah Saucedo. She is Computer Office Studies. Uh, and she is a, I think, first generation CCC to earn her college degree. And her walk up song is The Karate Kid, You Are the Best. So, applause for her. Juan Lopez. Juan Lopez is repping culinary arts. And he enjoys participating in triathlons. And he loves peanut butter. And he's addicted to coffee. So, welcome, Juan. Uh, he's also teaching uh, Devon uh, Scott. He's a DSPS counselor, and his favorite quote is, the handicap of deafness is not in the ear, it is in the mind. Andreina uh, Lucero, uh, she's also um, out right now, and her she's first-gen Mexican-American, and she grew up playing soccer. Go. 
Benjamin Sampson. Uh, he's visual media arts. And he loves movies, and he's an avid cuddler with his kitty, Celine, which I think is awesome. So that's awesome. CCC. Next we have, uh, she's teaching right now at PCC, uh, Leslie Davila. And she is an avid yogi and a first-gen uh, Guatemalan American. And Tiffany Green, uh, she, yes, she's from ESL Linguistics. And she loves reading and playing video games. And she loves coffee. And also teaching right now uh, from English, Anjali. And she loves gardening, and she's ambidextrous, and she plays basketball in her spare time. I know, she's, she's ripping the East Coast. I mean, the West Coast. Ooh, sorry. Let's see. Uh, just kidding. Uh, so uh, next we have Mark Martinez. And he did it. Yes, Mark. He's from the Department of Fashion, and he's not doing a walk-up song. He's doing a drag race lip sync song. So he's uh, anything Barbara Streisand, Linda Edler sing, uh, singing duets that have nothing to do with sports. Yes, yes, yes. Love it, love it. And then we have Carlos Campos uh, from Construction, and I believe he is working right now. He's allergic to cats, but he likes to learn a little bit about everything. And John Siklik, he's from COSA, CCC. He is a retired US Navy commander, and he really wanted me to know that his Yankee, not Dodger walk-up song, I'm gonna allow it, um, is Mr. Blue Sky by ELO. I still love him anyway. Uh, Rebecca Bora, she is teaching. Also, she is in life sciences, and her Dodger walk-up song is Stronger by Kelly Clarkson. Uh, Michael Wild, he is from Visual Media Arts, and his favorite quote is, we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. I love that. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, let's see here. Not cooperating. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Uh, Nikia Banks, she's teaching. Uh, she is in history, uh, poli and ethnic studies, and she is a Long Beach native. She speaks German, and she, uh, her Dodger walk-up song is Run the World um, by Beyonce. And then we have Carlos Ochoa. He is from Electrical Technology, and he loves to travel and uh, do martial arts. And his Dodger walk-up song is New Order, uh, Blue Monday. And Erica, who's also in life science, she's microbio. She loves to salsa dance, cumbia, and merengue. And she used to be a competitive ice skater, but she's teaching right now. <laughs> why is this going so slow? I'm so, I don't know why this is in. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then um, Dr. Raquel Marples Villanueva, she's teaching right now at PCC. She's a registered nurse, um, and she's been an RN for 15 years, and she wants everybody to know that her son is better than yours. So. <laughs> uh, and then we have Frank Henry Allah. He's in kinesiology, public health. Um, he was a former D1 basketball player, and he also loves to dance. And his walk-up song is uh, Danza Furor. Kuroro, Kuroro, uh, by Don Omar. And then we have Diana Gonzalez. Is Diana here? No, she's teaching. There's a lot of people teaching this. She is math and engineering. And she said her favorite quote is math make friends. And that's her quote. She's quoting herself. Uh, and she loves Disneyland. And we have uh, Jacob, uh, J Jordan Jacobsma. See, he's from CTE. See? And he's doing a construction. Yes, 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 with the group here. And I think, is that everybody? Yeah, I think that's it, right? 
<gasps> Kimberly, did I skip you? I, I saw your quote. I saved the best for last. Let me go back. I did. Here, let me go back here. I saw you. I know she's there. Yeah. <laughs> this laptop is Kimberly. I'm so sorry. I don't know. Where are you? I saw your slide. We, we do have our employment document, so it's okay. <laughs> we, we have what? I'm sorry? I was joking that we have our employment documents. So oh, yes, okay. yes, yes. Do you want to introduce yourself? Because I don't know. Her slide disappeared. Yes, sure. come up here. Kimberly. My name is Kimberly Mosley, and I am with the Electrical Technology Department. And fact about myself is I'm a California native. And my song is Go Get It by Mary Mary. And, and yeah, I think that's it. I think we're good. Thank you so much. Uh, if you want to take a picture, if that's possible. Really yes, quick. yes. We'll yes. take a quick recess to take a photo. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so welcome much. Welcome, everybody. Look forward to working with so you. So congratulations we'll, to the Musketeers. You yeah, go line up down. and we'll take a picture. Yeah, we're going to come down now. I like how Stacy.
Thank you and welcome to all the new faculty members and folk. thank you to all the staff who spent hundreds of hours interviewing and meeting with potential candidates. We look forward to working with all of our new staff. Moving on from item 3.1 to 3.2 is resolution on disability history and slash awareness uh, month. Uh, this is a resolution uh, recommended to the Board of Trustees adopt resolution number 101922B, recognizing Disability History and Awareness Month. This is an action item. We need a motion and a second to advance. So moved. Second. A motion by Trustee Baxter, second by Trustee Zia. Uh, any discussion on the item? We do have um, a speaker, for, I think a speaker from the, our employee uh, group, uh, Jason Ong. Jason, are you here? Would you like to say something briefly? Thank you. Hello, everyone. I was told I was not supposed to say anything. I was not required to say anything, I should say. So it comes as a big surprise that I have to say something. So if I have to say something, hello. <laughs> well, well, thank you for being with us. We do have a resolution. We're, we have a framed copy of tonight's resolution for you uh, that we'll, we'll give you after the vote. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm sorry, I had it, in my, I had it uh, on my paper to talk. Uh, any other discussion on the, uh, the motion before us? See, seeing and hearing none, I, we, I guess we should actually do a roll call vote because Vice President Chico is on the audio, right? Um, Secretary Reese, can we do a roll call vote to make sure we get uh, Vice President Chico's vote? Of course. And we'd start with our student trustee. Uh, student trustee Hernandez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Herlinda Chico? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduak Joe Intuck? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. All right. The, the Resolution is adopted, and we're also going to take a brief recess to take a photo and present the, the, the framed copy of the resolution. So we're going down there then? Yep. All right, moving to item 3.3, this is another resolution. This is recognizing Fil Filipino American History Month. It's recommended the Board of Trustees adopt a resolution 101922C, uh, recognizing Filipino American History Month as submitted. I'll need a motion and a second. Motion by uh, Trustee. Second. Motion by Trustee Malulu. I, th I think I had a tie. Is that, was that a virtual Vice President Chico? <laughs> it was. <laughs> we'll go with second <laughs> Vice President Chico. Um, any discussion on the resolutions presented? I know we do have some guests here. Yeah. Yeah. Trustee Malulu. I would like to uh, speak on this motion and this resolution and thank my colleagues on the board. This is, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the second time that we've had this resolution. The first time we did it was when I was board chair a couple years ago. 
And uh, the reason why this resolution is so important to me, while I am not of Filipino descent, um, my, one of the families closest to me who, uh, in whose home I grew up in, in Carson, uh, my best friend is Filipino. Uh, the Batuco family, there's a Milan family, Funtania, and I'm always the one non-Filipino member at those family parties, and I grew up with that culture and my trustee area in West Long Beach actually has the largest constituency of Filipinos in Long Beach. And it's an important resolution to recognize um, the contributions that the Filipino community has made, not only in Long Beach, but also throughout the history of California and the United States, particularly during wartime, yep. and particularly with regard to some of the issues that we face in the labor movement with a lot of migrant workers and um, issues that the Filipino Migrant Center today continues to fight with regard to um, human trafficking. And uh, there were several stories that broke around the time that I brought this resolution to the board two years ago happening in uh, the Los Angeles area with abuse of Filipino families and children. So I would like to thank, and we've got Romeo Hebron here from the Filipino Migrant Center, is there anyone else here for this resolution? Because if you are, I definitely want to acknowledge you. I can't see. I'm going to put my glasses on. But I do know that Romeo is here. Thank you. If you could please stand, I would really appreciate that. And we welcome you. And uh, we're very proud to present this resolution to you. And I would also like to take a moment to thank staff because of the time and uh, when I read this resolution, so there are several resolutions that we've written here at the district, and the um, Hispanic uh, Latino Cultural Heritage Month one, which also happened uh, when I was board chair, brought tears to my eyes because I saw Honduras, the country where I was born, in print for the first time. And then this one brought tears to my eyes, and we were able to use it again. So thank you to everyone who contributed to this. And I'm very excited that you're here to accept this resolution. I know last time it was Alex Montances, and now you are his successor and uh, with the board chair, if, if I don't know if he would allow it, but if you would like to say a few words on behalf of the Migrant Center. Sure, we welcome it. There's, uh, thank you. Good evening, thank you everyone. Uh, my name is Romeo Hebron, I'm the executive director for the Filipino Migrant Center, and we are based in Westside Long Beach. Um, where um, trustee um, mentioned, you know, where the highest concentration of Filipinos are. I just wanted to thank you all for um, really recognizing this uh, Filipino American History Month. It really makes me reflect on my own time as a college student and feeling that sense of pride and knowing about our history, um, not just for Filipinos, but, you know, I think for all ethnic studies. And it really, learning about my own history as a Filipino and our achievements here in this country, in the state, and in the city, actually really changed my whole career path and my career trajectory to really be more involved with the community. So on behalf of the Filipino Migrant Center, I just wanted to say thank you um, for, um, for recognizing this. I'd just like to add, uh, thank you so much for being with us. Um, I, I was able to participate in the uh, Filipino American celebration yesterday. And uh, I, we, were, we were talking about it earlier. It was a, a, uh, such a joyous collection. It's been so long in the last two years we've not been together to come together. There were so many smiling faces, uh, but the, the two students we had that were singing were so powerful. Um, one sang the uh, Filipino National Anthem, another sang uh, some songs in Tagalog, a cappella, and it just uh, it really moved. My son was with me, he was dancing uh, to the music, uh, he's a six-year-old, uh, but it was just um, very heartwarming, uh, another affirmation of, you know, uh, uh, all student agenda that everybody is welcome here at Long Beach City College and excited uh, to, to have the resolution tonight. We're gonna give a, uh, we have another couple copies. I have the um, Lulu, Judy, Dr. Bracera, Romeo are gonna come up afterwards to do a photo. But first, let's, if there's not any more comments, we can take a vote. Anybody else? If, if just quick, I'll, Trustee I'll be, Baxter. I'll be quick. Congratulations, and I think it's very appropriate that we're recognizing you during this month because the, I, maybe many people don't know the an outstanding contributions Filipinos 
uh, have made to American history, especially in time of war. And we really appreciate that because you uh, suffered a great deal during World War II and you're very patriotic to the United States and we appreciate it. Thank you. With that, we'll take a roll call vote, uh, Secretary Reese. Student Trustee Hernandez. <coughs> That's definitely a nine for me. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Herlinda Chico. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduakjo Intuk. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. The resolution is adopted. We'll take a brief uh, recess for the, take a photo. Thank you, everybody. And before we go on, uh, our, from our employee resource group, I'll have Lulu say a, a brief couple of comments about the, the resolution. Thank you, Trustee Intuck. Uh, my name is Lulu Monte Tapua. I currently serve as the president for the Asian Pacific Islander Desi Affinity Group here on our college campus. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, on behalf of the Filipino American History Month Working Group, uh, for those who were uh, from the bottom of our student assistants to our director of student equity, to our staff, to our faculty, we really thank um, our college and our institution for allowing us to have that space to celebrate. When we think about Filipino American History Month, in the month of October, it commemorates the first record of Filipinos in the continental U.S. where they arrived in October 18th of 1587. Uh, and arrived in Morro Bay, California, right? Not Washington, not Oregon, but California. And even more so when we think about Filipino American history, um, our Filipino American Na National Historical Society is proud to announce the theme of celebrating our history and our legacies. Uh, this year, we commemorate 50 years of Filipino American studies. 40 years of the Filipino American National Historical Society and 30 years of celebrating Filipino American History Month. And we always kindly recommend and re-emphasize that this is a history month and not a heritage month. We commemorate our struggles, we commemorate our resiliency and our contribution to US history. And so we really look forward to celebrating with you all um, as we celebrate this 30th annual Filipino American History Month. And um, in our native tongue, I'll have uh, Judy um, share with us uh, her gratitude 
um, for, uh, for, uh, for you all. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Judy Quilleton, and I'm a transfer, um, I work in the transfer center as an enrollment specialist. I also serve as a treasurer of Asian Pacific Islander DESI um, community here at Long Beach City College. Uh, we just like to really um, express our deepest gratitude to everyone, uh, to the Board of Trustees, to the, to the Long Beach City College family. Malaming salamat sa inyong lahat. That means um, thank you very much to all of you. Mahal ko kayo. Mahal namin kayo. We love you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're moving on now to item 3.4, uh, our last resolution uh, in this section. It's resolution LGBTQ History Month. It's recommended that the Board of Trustees adopt re resolution 101922D, uh, recognizing LGB LBGTQ History Month as submitted. This is an action item we'll need a motion and a second for. Um, second. We got a motion by Trustee Zia, a second by Trustee Baxter. Uh, any discussion on this item? Uh, I think that was me that made the motion. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> we'll go motion by Vice President Chico, seconded by Trustee Baxter. We still have the uh, plastic up and there's a little <laughs> bit of a echo delay. Um, so on this item, um, I, I have Stefan and Kim from our resource group. And, and then also we, we do have Dr. Koenig's wife, Chris Koenig with us tonight. Um, you know, folks may not be aware, unfortunately, last week uh, we lost Dr. Koenig, who is a faculty member here uh, in our history and curriculum chair in the Academic Senate, and uh, we uh, itemized her in the resolution and also wanted to give a copy to her wife, Chris, who's with us tonight, uh, and we, we also have a bouquet of flowers for her from on behalf of the board and the college uh, as part of our condolences. And, and those of you who may have known Wendy, she was... Um, a mover or shaker, she moved the needle here at Long Beach City College, becoming more and more inclusive. Some of the changes that we've seen over the last five to 10 years is directly related to the work of Dr. Koenig. Um, you know, I met her some 10 years ago in the community, not even here on campus. Some of the broad work that she was doing around organizing and coalition building. Uh, and she just av strongly advocated for uh, historically underrepresented groups, LGBTQIA+, um, students, um, making sure that we had an inclusive policy and practices, that what we do here is not just rhetoric, but it's reality. Uh, but she was a fierce advocate for the LGBTQIA community here in Long Beach City College and across the region. Um, you know, there, we talk about many times of uh, many Wendy's, of all the thousands of students and the leaders that she's poured into and invested uh, that have really made our world a better place. And it's just with great sadness that we, we did not know that she was ill uh, until the very last moment. And uh, it's a big loss for our campus community. Uh, and she, she just did so much for so many and we really wanna recognize her. I know I assume in during that academic Senate report we'll, we'll go into more detail. But at this time, we, we do have a motion and a second and any other trustees that like to say anything before we take a vote? Yeah, uh, thank you, President Nantuck. Yes, um, I met Wendy before she was received a full-time contract. She helped uh, with the um, Asian um, artwork that we have in, in Building I. And she was such an important member of the art faculty and really uh, elevated us um, as a, a well-renowned uh, his, a historian of art history, and um, I mourn her loss, and my heart goes out to her wife. Hey, Trustee Zia? Yes, I'd like to echo Trustee Baxter's, um, Dr. Baxter's um, words um, without uh, really losing it. Um, I, this just broke my heart, this news. Um, um, Wendy was uh, a true champion for all things good. And I remember um, working uh, with her and giving her some suggestions um, um, on the ethnic studies curriculum and um, the topic of intersectionality and covering that component. And she was always someone who listened closely and cared for our students and took into account everyone's perspective and was a true champion for 
what goodness should be, what a model institution we should be, and a model behavior we all should emulate. And I will miss her dearly. I just saw her at the Labor Day Parade, and um, um, I'm glad I was able to give her a warm hug, and um, she'll always be immortal in my heart and in my thoughts. And um, I really appreciate the legacy she leaves behind for this institution. Thank you, Wendy. And to all those people who she touched, I'm sure they will share the sentiment. Thank you, Trustee Malulu. Yes, um, I too would like to express my deepest condolences to Dr. Koenig's family. Uh, I think the reason why this particular passing is so shocking to us is because many of us didn't know that she was ill. I didn't know. And the fact that she was such a consummate professional and was so diligent in her work and so thorough in every detail of every project and every product that she presented just astounds me because never once did she let on, at least not to me, and I worked with her. In fact, I pulled up a couple of emails from her. I worked with her on a couple of projects. And sometimes when we get emails about the passing of a colleague, uh, oftentimes it is a retired colleague or someone who has moved on. Um, I think the last time, um, that I recall, and uh, Trustee Baxter, you probably have uh, more of a recollection of this, but the last time I remember a, an active current passing was, I believe it was 2015 or 16, and it was uh, Julian. I think that's the last time that we had an active colleague who had passed. So this was especially shocking to have someone who is currently working that passed. Um, I just want to share a particular email that Dr. Koenig and I had exchanged a few months ago. Uh, we were talking about a presentation that she'd done to the board back in 2020. Again, I happened to be board chair and I'd sent her an email uh, commending her on the work that she did. And she replied, it was a pleasure to have the opportunity to present to the board. We appreciate the interest and the support she will continue to track data, we'll move forward, she'll be happy to report on our progress again in the future. And that was Dr. Koenig. She, instead of just saying, thank you, she said, thank you, I'm gonna do more. Thank you, there's more coming. Thank you, I'm gonna continue working. And that was who she was. So thank you for sharing her with us, and I'm sorry we didn't know. And we all, we really lament this, and Dr. <sighs> we received this wonderful email with a sort of work biography of her, which just had, I think, all of us in tears. So thank you to the family. Thank you. Uh, Vice President Chico, I know you're an audio remote. I don't know if you had anything to say. Um, while I did not uh, know um, Dr. Koenig, it was, um, I did read um, the information that was sent out and Vivian is and uh, trustee Malaulu is completely right it um, it touched you in a way that even if you didn't know her as well uh, you felt the passion and commitment to education and inclu inclusivity um, by, by just reading her her bio and so this is a tremendous loss for LBCC uh, and I extend my personal condolences to all of her family and friends and everyone that she touched. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we'll have a roll call vote, and then we do have a presentation. Secretary Reese? St student Trustee Hernandez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Harlinda Chico? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uruakjo Intak? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. The resolution is adopted. We're going to take a brief uh, recess.
my, my now <coughs> kind of, okay. No, 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 I agree, I agree with you completely. Would have been a different inappropriate. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, thank you for your participation. Uh, again, our condolences. We'll move on now to item 15.1 on the agenda. This is public comments on non-agenda items. Uh, this is an opportunity for public to provide uh, their public comment, three minutes per speaker, no more than 20 uh, minutes allowed per subject. I do have several speaker cards. We'll move into, um, start off with uh, Diana Buchanan for three minutes. That's Dana Buchanan. First, I'm going to read the remarks from John Malvo, a recent inductee to the Hall of Fame for the record. In support of Dr. Virginia Baxter re-election, I'm alumni of LBCC and have known Dr. Virginia Baxter for approximately 20 years, but more closely over the past 10 or 12. We consistently share a face-to-face -face conversation at an annual NAACP fundraising event. She's also been honored She's also been honored at the annual fundraiser. Last year, I was named to the LBCC Hall of Fame after being nominated by Dr. Baxter. I'm president of the Long Beach Central Area Association nonprofit devoted to presenting arts and education programs, events that promote diversity and human dignity. Dr. Baxter permitted me to the post information on her Facebook page for my events. Since I most often post more on her page than I post, I delete my posts on her page. <laughs> we'll skip that part. Dr. Baxter has demonstrated consistent commitment to the ideals of Long Beach City College Board, and she has contributed to her inter-ethnic relations during her tenure on the LBCC Board. These are my comments. Uh, Dana Buchanan, I'm the owner of Primal Alchemy Catering. I'm also a community and business partner with my business to the um, college, and also uh, my husband and I, who you just met, I believe, um, are, are on the Culinary Advisory Committee. We also just held a fundraiser for the culinary program, which we'll be presenting a check to you, pretty good size one, very soon. I've known Ginny Baxter for a very long time. She's always been a fair, competent, inclusive leader. She has often been the clear and logical voice in the room and has always had the students in mind first and foremost. I admire her and I know her character, personal integrity and ethics are at the center of her life. I am appalled and disgusted at the politicization of your position, Udawak. Shame on you for maligning her good name. The only people that lose here are the students. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next public comment from Robin Gordon Peterson. Good evening. My name is Robin Gordon Peterson, and I am in the district of Herlinda Chico. However, prior to being in her district, I was in Ginny Baxter's district. And I'm here to say that I support you, Dr. Baxter, and I have a couple of comments. The first comment is from Miss Naomi Rainey. I'm going to speak her words into the record and then I'll go to my own. My name is Naomi Rainey Pearson. I have known Dr. Virginia Baxter for over 30 years. I have a background in cultural diversity and human relations. In addition, I have been an advocate for social justice, inclusion, and civil rights. I was born in Mississippi during the tumultuous civil rights era and definitely know and understand racism. Dr. Baxter is not a racist. She supports African Americans and other people of color. It is very difficult and heartbreaking for me to believe this recent ludicrous accusation of racism against her. This accusation appears to be baseless and politically motivated. 
I write this as Naomi Rainey Pearson, a citizen. It has no affiliation with any organization or entity I'm associated with, and I want this matter resolved. Now I'll go on for my own comment. I am going to be quoting various people that have written articles about remaining silent in the voice of injustice. And so I will say their names at the end because I don't want you to feel that they're my words. These are words that my daughter, who attends Long Beach City College, wanted me to read into the record. She's 18 years old and has been following this latest debacle that we're all talking about. Moments of silence are used in contemplation, reflection, and remembrance of loved ones lost. However, remaining silent also can be highly unethical. We should be careful that our silence is not deceptive, allowing others to believe that we know what we know for certain is not true. So let me tell you what that means. If you've heard a lie and you stand up and listen to the lie and you don't speak out on it, you are no better than the person telling and or giving misinformation. We ought not remain silent when facing injustice and abuse, but speak truth to power. We should not remain silent when witnessing wrongdoing. In these circumstances, silence is not morally acceptable. We have a duty to speak up. William Faulkner said, never be afraid to raise your voice for honesty, truth, and compassion against injustice, lying, and greed. If people all over this world would get off their duffs and do what's right, this world would be a better place. Speak up against injustice when you know what's wrong. And finally, silence is the most toxic strategy to reputation and integrity. If you know the words that are written and that you've heard are false, if you remain silent, you are no better than the person speaking. And I speak to everyone in this room. Thank you. Next, we have Brian Russell on non-agenda items for three minutes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Brian Russell, and I'm here to support Dr. Baxter. I've known Dr. Baxter for 40 years, first as a student here in 1982 when I joined Long Beach City College, and then when I was uh, elected student body president, I worked with Dr. Baxter. When I was a student trustee in 83-84, I worked with Dr. Baxter. I worked with her at the very beginning parts of the Long Beach City College Foundation, and I continued to sit on the board of the foundation. I was entered in when she was the executive director. And I still work with her today on the foundation board. I'm, I have the privilege of chairing the Helping Homeless Students uh, Committee, which is a division of the, of the foundation. That's all here to say that there are some in this room that might know Dr. Baxter better than I, but I believe I can tell you from the bottom of my heart that any allegations other than Dr. Baxter is dedicated, cares for the students, inclusive leader, and a community leader, they're just not accurate. So I'm here to support Dr. Baxter and thank you for your decades of service and being a mentor to me. And we're here in solidarity with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Felton Williams, public comment on non-agenda items. Good evening, um, President Uduak. Members of the board, executive staff, faculty, and students. My name is Felton Williams. And I'm here tonight to support Dr. Virginia Baxter, who's a dear friend and colleague uh, that I've known for the better part of 24 years. Uh, in my capacity as a former dean of business and social science here, and also the dean of the trades here at, at Long Beach City College, and as well as uh, member of the Board of Education, Long Beach Unified School District. That relationship has allowed me to develop a deep and enduring level of respect for Jenny and, has, and, uh, has, uh, and her uh, work on behalf of the district and the Long Beach community. 
Uh, when I first set foot on this campus in 1996 as a college dean, Jenny was one of the first to greet me and subsequently open the door for me to join Leadership Long Beach. She also worked with me that first year in promoting the work of the trades and their programs. On another note, Jenny's efforts in her capacity as director of the Long Beach City College Foundation, the college led the state community college districts in financial gifts that resulted in consistent and sustained financial aid support to students and grants for faculty and staff. The college promise represented a significant and major accomplishment in the state and has been the recipient of universal praise by the California State Legislature, who contributed approximately $5 million to replicate and implement the program throughout the state, and from President Barack Obama, who introduced it as, at a, national, as a national model. The program represents a partnership among the city's educational institutions to offer a pathway to students who might never experience a college education. To date, the program has done just that, opening the doors for all students and students of color to advance their status in life. Jenny was tasked initially with finding the financial support for the program to fund students' first year at LBCC. She was then tasked with finding tuition for two years. She was successful in doing both. Jenny is highly regarded in the city and the state as a knowledgeable and caring person who gives freely of her time to others. She more than deserves respect for who she is and her commitment to equity and fairness. And such and as such, truly deserves a public apology. I do have one more statement to read from Dr. Minnie Douglas, who's a past faculty member here at Long Beach City College. The communication to the board is in support of Dr. Jenny Baxter due to unfortunate and untrue comments in the media relative to her character by Board President Udawak Joe Intuck. Inherent in the college's mission statement is an, is an expectation that a positive and respectful attitude is an expectation uh, of all associated with the college. The most recent untrue and most negative comments submitted to media by the board president in reference to trustee Dr. Jenny Baxter does not adhere to these principles. Based upon my understanding of a board member's obligations, I am requesting that trustee Udawak offer a public apology to Trustee Baxter and a, and a comment that he will refrain from further derogatory, derogatory comments regarding fellow trustees. Thank you all very much. Thank you. We have uh, Charlotte Joseph next, three minutes for public comment. Hello, my name is Charlotte Weiser Joseph. I'm a retired faculty member from Long Beach City College, being here for almost 40 years. I'm here today speaking in many capacities um, as the past union president, two times over, the academic senate president, the curriculum chair, the honors coordinator, how am I doing? In all of these, history and political science chair, I come from a position that I have known this woman well over 35 years, Dr. Virginia Baxter. I have not been back at the college and any formal function until this day because um, there was nothing for me to add. Today I will add that the board president used his position, played politics, and unjustly made claims that are untrue, are false, and only could benefit his own political future or claims. When we talk about a QAnon conspiracy, I taught my students that we need to know the facts, we need to be able to think critically. If someone disagrees with you, there's something to be learned from their ideas. Jenny and I have spent our lives fighting and disagreeing with each other politically. I'm about as radical and liberal as you get. And she and I, people would ask, how could you two be friends? 
because we listened, we disagreed, we tried to learn from each other, and to the members of this board, just because a person votes against your point of view, if they are here voting for what they believe is best for the college and best for the students, you do not unjustly accuse them of conspiracy theories because the last time I checked, Ginny is not a child predator. She is not an anti-Semitic person. She is not, I, I don't, I, I'll stay off of those. But this is a letter I have from members of the community, including myself, and I will read it. I stand here tonight with many Long Beach Community College stakeholders calling for board president Uduak Joe Natuk's immediate public apology to trustee Ver Dr. Virginia Baxter for his recent specious public comments appearing in the local media reports. Further, we call for the trustee Natuk to immediately step down as president of the Long Beach City College Board of Trustees for your recent verbal attacks on an elected colleague. Words have meaning. Misleading, misleading words are most vile. Dr. Um, Trustee Natuk, the stakeholders are awaiting your apology. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> we have one last uh, public comment on non-agenda items. Pat Wong. Uh, good evening, trustees. I have two uh, statements that I'm reading on behalf of other community members before um, stating my own position. The first comes from Jill Rosenberg. I have known Ginny Baxter for decades. She is an honest, ethical, straightforward person. I have served with her on several nonprofit boards and always found her to be compassionate and caring and informed. She cares deeply about the students of City College and devotes her energies and expertise expertise to helping them. These comments by an individual accusing her of nefarious things are baseless and absurd. You couldn't find a better person to serve on the LBCC Board of Directors. I am glad she is there. Once again, that's from Jill Rosenberg. Uh, I am going to read a statement next from uh, Myra Flores. I wish to express support for Virginia Baxter. In all of the time I have known her, she is truly a committed community servant. She is kind, generous, passionate, and compassionate, and is always striving for what is best for students. Her role and historical knowledge of LBCC and serving on the LBCC Board of Trustees is critical as we learn from the past and look to the future to continue to grow and strengthen our beloved community college to withstand the test of time. Virginia Baxter is a noble, dedicated, and well-respected community leader. Um, next is my statement. As I uh, mentioned, my name is Pat Wong. I'm a constituent of uh, Dr. Baxter's 5th District, and I am also a student at LBCC, having just enrolled this quarter, or this semester rather, after 40 years from my last degree. So I'm really enjoying the asset that is LBCC. I'm also a former member of the Board of um, uh, the Board of Directors for the LBC's Foundation and proudly served under Dr. Baxter's uh, tenure there. I read the ludicrous and false allegations that the chair of the board has leveled against Dr. Virginia Baxter and was frankly outraged. There is no one who has served LBCC more faithfully, raised more funds, or supported the college's most vulnerable students, our homeless students, than Dr. Baxter. She has also served the greater community and advanced equity through her board service at the California Congress for Equality and Justice, CCEJ, and is an active member of the Rotary Club of Long Beach, the American Association of University Women, the Assistance League, and I'm probably forgetting a whole host of other organizations, charitable and civic, that she has served on and is committed to creating a more equitable and just community and removing disparities and barriers to resources and services for all. Like many here, I have known Dr. Baxter for a very long time, more than 30 years. And I just realized that was you know, almost half my life without disclosing my age here. 
And she has been a very, very good friend, a mentor, travel guide, you know, and a good neighbor. To accuse her of forwarding conspiracy theories, of being against ethnic studies and critical race theory, or most absurdly, being a member of QAnon is patently absurd. Dr. Baxter is kind, smart, and fair. And as um, Charlotte mentioned earlier, we don't often see eye to eye on all the issues. But in more than 30 years, I have never heard her express any conspiracy theories or racist sentiments. To make these allegations is unconscionable, irresponsible, and morally re reprehensible. I demand, respectfully, a full Thank public you. apology and retraction of these hideous Thank lies. Thank you so much. We're now, appreciate all the public comments. We are now moving to section four, standing reports. Item 4.1 is ASB reports from our uh, student president. I don't, I don't believe she's here tonight though. No. We'll move on to our student trustee report for five minutes. Is trustee Hernandez. Thank you, President Intuck and the Board of Trustees. Um, I would love to report this past month, it has been an honor to attend uh, many events and meeting so many new faces. I had the pleasure to meet with Dean of Student uh, Affairs, Deborah Miller, and I am so honored to be her first student trustee to work with. Um, we discussed and game plan future goals and how to provide for student needs uh, and we will be continuing meeting every once a month. Um, also, I had the pleasure to meet with Vice President of Student Services, Dr. Noel Corral, uh, with ASB President uh, Alana. He was amazing in providing us information on what to expect in our position, as well as extending his services and providing his guidance. I first want to thank Trustee Baxter for inviting me to my first uh, student trustee event to the Helping Homeless Student Fundraiser. It was truly an amazing event at the PCC Garden. Um, on behalf of all the students, we want to thank every single per uh, person um, that contributes to keeping this foundation going. Um, home insecurity is a major topic that many students feel uncomfortable speaking about, let alone asking for help. Um, as a student that faced house insecurity and an eviction process, um, I also was afraid to ask for help. I felt that I would have been judged by those around me, and I can assure my fellow peers that that isn't the case, and the campus is always happy to help. At the beginning of the month, we had the virtual hall meeting uh, via Zoom, uh, moderated by ASB President Alana and myself. Uh, we were able to ask our campus vice president, uh, Dr. Chet, Dr. Corral, and um, <laughs> Dr. Douglas. Um, uh, we were able to ask questions um, submitted by students, um, you know, uh, questions that regarding uh, campuses and improvement, right, and their point of views. Um, and as well, doc having Dr. President as superintendent, uh, Dr. Munoz, um, which was an amazing, great turnaround, resourceful event. Um, now, uh, finally, something that ASB President Alana also wanted to report. I know that she wasn't able to attend here. Um, we are looking forward to attending this weekend our student leadership conference um, in San Diego. Uh, most of our cabinet um, members will be attending the event and we're excited to meet other students um, from other campuses and getting their perspective, uh, point of view on helping other fellow peers. Um, we also want to announce that we were able to add two more uh, students into our cabinet um, ASB. And um, that's pretty much the end of my report. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll now go to item 4.3, Academic Senate Presence Report for five minutes, so Suman. Um, I would like to start off by thanking the board for extending the time for my report tonight. Um, and while tonight there were a lot of updates that I could provide, um, the Academic Senate has decided to dedicate our entire report to Dr. Wendy Kennig 
a staunch faculty advocate who was fiercely committed to her work and had a real love and passion for curriculum. I'd like to start off by reading a note from the family. Wendy Kenig's wife, Chris, has said that in the 12 years they were together, she could recall every argument between them because there were so few. Unfortunately, many of those discussions were about how much time Wendy spent on her work. They were only married when Wendy had a break from North Central College in Illinois. Their honeymoon was, in, was to Montreal, where Wendy had been invited to present a paper on Holocaust studies during a humanities conference. She never gave less than 110% whenever it involved anything about education. In her final days, she reminisced about a long list of students that she impacted. Chris is now hearing from a number of those students, and each email is heartbreakingly sorrowful. Some have said that Wendy forever altered their life's trajectory. One student who attended Middle, Middle T Tennessee State University wrote that she literally saved his life. Wendy was modest, unpretentious, unselfish, and she was humble. She had a PhD, but never required anyone to address her as doctor. She never took credit when it wasn't due and was always quick to spin the spotlight toward other colleagues and recognize their efforts instead. She was dedicated to students and she devoted herself to anything that could improve their experience, whether that was a process within the classroom or advocating for a map for bathrooms, Chip. <laughs> she was a multi-published author with books you can fi still find on Amazon.com and art reviews in multiple peer-reviewed journals, including art papers and international print publication. Along with Chris, she created a blog, a blog that is one of the most comprehensive guides to public art in Chicago, the WindyCityPublicArt.com. Many have been shocked by her passing because she didn't want anyone to know that she was ill. A member of the 2014 new faculty cohort, the first cohort to name themselves as the Fabulous 42. She loved teaching art history, serving as curriculum chair, a senator on the Academic Senate, and member of the Academic Senate Executive Board. She was proud, particularly proud of the role that she played as an original member of the faculty team that developed the cultural curriculum audit. During her last week, she taught her honors art history class on Monday morning. Immediately after a trip to the oncologist on Tuesday, she hopped onto Zoom for a student learning outcomes meeting. On Wednesday, she attended the course evaluation subcommittee meeting and logged into Canvas to grade papers. The hospice nurse arrived that evening and she slipped into a coma by Friday night. Until the end, she focused on her duty to her colleagues and the success of her students. Because she sacrificed so much of her personal time and energy to do what she loved so dearly, her family wants the Long Beach City College community to understand how much she gave of herself to this institution and how much it mattered to her. If she were here, she would never be seeking recognition, but her family knows she deserves every bit of it. Now on a personal note, I couldn't think of any other word to describe her better than that she was a force. When I look back on my years serving for, of my years working of service and leadership on this campus, to no surprise, Wendy has been there at every turn. She and I started as full-time faculty together in 2014 as part of the Fabulous 42. We were on course evaluation together. We were on curriculum together. We worked together in a lot in my role as FPD coordinator through the Senate and now in my role as Senate president. I would describe Wendy as someone who provided me a lot of tough love. Her encouragement, although not always conventional, made me a better person. She wasn't afraid to tell me how I could do better or call me out. But with this came support to help me do it. Wendy always provide, provided excellence and she expected excellence. She was the one faculty member on campus that I knew I could always reach out to without question and knew I would receive a response. If she knew the answer, she would give it to me. And if she didn't, she would sure as hell make sure she found out as quickly as she could. She always went above and beyond for us as her colleagues and for her students. I'd like to read some quotes from some of the faculty on campus. 
I was hired with Wendy in 2014 and I watched in awe as she jumped right into leadership roles and spread her particular brand of magic around the college. Wendy's impact will not be forgotten. Dr. Wendy Kennig was a true hero. I found Wendy an exceptional leader, efficient colleague, and an extremely helpful individual. She was always there for us. The entire LBCC community will miss Wendy. She was a kindred spirit, a friend, and a, ver a very irreplaceable member of our leadership here at Long Beach City College. I know that those of us who served on committees with her will feel this loss especially. She was unparalleled in her energy, her intelligence, her compassion for students, her camaraderie, and her dedication to this institution. A true advocate for equity, justice, and cultural care across the board. She was someone that you knew you could always lean on and count on knowing the answer. I was always amazed, amazed by her energetic spirit despite the sheer volume of work that she completed on curriculum and other leadership roles. Her absence will be felt for a long time. But whether or not we know it, the impact she made on curriculum, policies, and all other sorts of projects will endure much longer. I looked up to her so much. She was a great mentor, and I wish I had the chance to tell her what an inspiration she was to me. She was one of the most generous, patient, and dedicated professionals that I'd ever met. A couple more. Wendy was a great source of advice and encouragement when I was in the process of adding a new course to programs curriculum. Thanks to her help, the new course was approved to be offered and is transferable to UC and Cal States. She played a major role in establishing the ethnic studies curriculum a year earlier than we would have. She was a true ally. Her integrity and thoughtfulness made such an impact on me. I'm inspired by her generous spirit and will always remember her. It's incredible to think of all the impact she had on this college in such a short time. Her energy and commitment, oh, I read that. Her effects on the college, her students and colleagues will continue for a long time. Wendy was a phenomenal individual who had profound impact here at Long Beach City College. Her work ethic, professionalism, breadth, and depth of her knowledge and dedication to her work and the college were unmatched. Dr. Kennig was a trailblazer and inspiration. Her work will have an everlasting impact on students' lives. Um, I'd now like to ask Dario if he would be able to play the most beautiful, heartfelt presentation that was created by uh, my wonderful colleague, Dr. Veronica. Well, we'll get there, right, Dr. Veronica Alvarez. Thank you, Dario. Can you turn the volume up, please? Thank you.
grave and weep, possibly by Mary Elizabeth Fry. We're done. Thank you. Do not. Thank you, Suman. We're now going to move to item uh, 4.4 4, uh, classified Senate presence report uh, with CC. Thank you. So we've heard some powerful words, some heartfelt words uh, this evening. And what I'm going to do is return us to a regular report. So Dario, uh, do you have the slides? So um, I've often spoken here about our statewide organization for California Community College's classified professionals. Um, it's called 4CS. And um, it increases communication to re represented colleges, cultivates, cultivates leadership opportunities for classified professionals, supports and guides classified professionals in assigning areas. It also represents classified professionals at the legislative la level. Next slide. So the exciting news I have to share is that our classified Senate Treasurer, Latanya Hardin, the college's travel coordinator, has been appointed at the state level board of directors for 4CS as an area representative for Area L. And you can see uh, it's broken up into areas throughout the state, and this is the Area L that we're part of, then that's the list of colleges that are part of that area. Besides being a great opportunity for LaTanya, this is excellent news for our Senate, for the college, and as it connects us even more to statewide happenings. LaTanya will be the first LBCC uh, classified professional to represent us through 4CS at the state level. So we're very excited for her and very proud of her. Next slide. So my usual uh, Wellness Wednesday, our wonderful Wellness Wednesday uh, events uh, are coming up and we're having to continue our wonderful uh, partnership with the CLAC area, Kinesiology. And uh, next slide. So the next one coming up is going to be October 26th um, and it's with LBCC instructor Brittany Lomelli and it's going to be on desk exercises and all about the LBCC Fitness Center. And for those of you who don't know, these are on Wednesday afternoons, well, obviously, Wellness Wednesday. Um, the next slide, in November, we have our wonderful HR specialist, Gloria Gonzalez-Wilson, who's going to show us her photography. So that's pretty exciting. Next slide. And this is kind of exciting as well. Uh, many classified senates throughout the state do a lot of activities like this, and we haven't really dipped our toe into it. We've been very encouraged by Dr. Munoz to do so. Um, you know, seize candy, uh, award ceremonies, and things like that. And so we haven't really gone there yet, but um, a lot of classified senates do have a lot of fun with these kind of things. So we're co-sponsoring a Halloween costume contest along with Dr. Munoz on the actual day of Halloween from 11 to 1. There's going to be um, obviously the costume contest. Um, we're going to be handing out candy and then um, they're going to be giving, the prizes are going to be bistro and bakery gift certificates. So that's pretty exciting. And of course, there's going to be a photo booth. So that's gonna be great. And then there is an event at PCC in the afternoon as well. So uh, it's gonna be difficult for everybody to go both to both, but it's gonna be a really fun day. Okay, so next slide. Um, and as usual, um, we have our classified hero of the month is Tracy Salazar. Her hero status is administrative assistant. Her team is the English department. Her superpowers are positive attitude, fast learner, and student advocate. The person who nominated her said Tracy is adored by our faculty and students alike. Her positive attitude is contagious. 
Tracy has been a student at LBCC, so she understands the experience and works hard to advocate for our students. And then Tracy's response was, my favorite thing about working at LBCC is being able to help the students behind the scenes and watch them succeed in their English classes. I'm honored to work with amazing colleagues and to be part of LBCC Classified. To go from a student worker to the double A for English within the last three years and be given the chance to give back to the students is one of my biggest accomplishments. Um, so one more thing before I uh, end my report is make sure you check item 8.2 on classified personnel on all the people that are new to the college, uh, many people who are working out of class, but especially at the very end of the report, we have two retirees. Um, one is Rick Astacio, who ended his career here at LBCC as lead custodian, and Adam Terraoka, who may have also had other jobs in the art department, but ended with a power tools, as power tools lab technician. So we wish them good luck in the future, and thank you for their, I think, decades of service on both of their parts. So thank you, and that's the end of my report. Thank you, CC. Moving now to 4.5 LBCC FA Barring Presence Report for five minutes. Uh, Suzanne's back with us. Yeah. We made it. Thank you. So for the extension that I guess I can. Okay. Greetings, distinguished members of the dais, members of the community, FA, Chi, AFP, and management to colleagues. Microphone. Go to the mic. Yes. Okay. On behalf of the Faculty Association, I want to thank our Academic Senate President, Suman Mudaneri, and our Faculty Professional Professional Development Coordinator, Veronica Alvarez, for the fine job they did tonight in honoring our colleague and friend, Wendy Koenig. Wendy, you will never be forgotten and you are missed. Thank you for your work and sacrifice to make our college a better place for students and faculty. I want to also send my condolence to Wendy's wife, Chris Koenig. Chris, my heartfelt prayers continue to go out to you. A quick Wendy and Chris story. Wendy and Chris fought to the bitter end against cancer. During that fight, Wendy continued to support this institution and her union. When Wendy could not attend to share her solidarity by showing up and wearing her red union shirt and voicing her displeasure during negotiations and the termination of Dr. Kashara Moore, her faithful wife, Chris, was there in her place and in solidarity with the Faculty Association. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Chris. We as a community are still processing Wendy's passing, and at the same time, we are celebrating our new faculty, new hires tonight. I am sorry I was not there tonight uh, to be a part of that due to a previous scheduled class, but I will honor you in my words. You 37 are an impressive bunch. I am excited to see what you are doing and look forward to your future contributions to the transformation of our college. Your faculty association is here to fight for you as probationary faculty. I want to acknowledge the sacrifice and countless hours our faculty put in every day, week, and month throughout the year to serve our students. When you talk about the front line, they are there. There are countless stories of learning that, will never, that we will never see, countless stories of extra hours spent helping students to get where they need to go, whether it is coming in early or staying late, adjusting due dates, conflict resolution, connecting students to resources to make their lives easier. Thank you, faculty for what you do in and out of the classroom. I had the privilege of attending the Filipino History Month kickoff event yesterday, Good Food and Entertainment. I enjoyed my meal with a student who is an, ins who is an ins aspiring film director. We shared food and stories, and she gave me a tip on what instructor to take for a film class. Our, co <laughs> Our conversation began by her sharing an observation that we, United States folks, sing our anthem everywhere. She then proceeded to sing her country's anthem. It was beautiful. Then I connected with another member of the Filipino community that connected me to her brother as a potential hire for our electrical program. We are in a good place and growing at LBCC. Thank you to all the employees that were a part of putting this event together. And thank you, Mike, for the support and encouragement to allow for this level of growth and engagement. 
I am glad my position provides the privilege to attend these events. I know when I have a full load and am teaching and not in my FA president capacity at PCC, I'm not able to attend a lot of these events. So I appreciate that memory. So many good things are going on at our college and we are all here for the students, but then there is politics. When faculty association members feel passionate about a topic and choose to individually or collectively attend a board meeting to speak, as president, it's not my responsibility to censor them, especially when the First Amendment protects freedom of speech. The LBCCFA wears red shirts as a symbol of solidarity with the hope that the board can be self-reflective and aware that their actions are not always in alignment with our advocacy. In my opinion, integrity and morality are more important than loyalty. If a a board member has something to share with the faculty association about racist speech, thoughts, or ideas of their fellow board members that you feel we need to know in order to make informed decisions. Please do not wait till the political season to share with me about this, especially if you had this information for months. Otherwise, what is the true motive, political gain, or stamping out racism in all forms? As the board charged the superintendent president in the following resolution, 624201, to work together with the LBCC's participatory governance leaders, faculty, staff, and students, as well as other community leaders, educational partners, et cetera, such as Long Beach, et cetera, sorry. I ask that members of the board check to make sure they are not compromising this resolution or any other resolution that is designed to work together in a framework of reconciliation. Political gain at the expense of our institutional goals is not acceptable. Mike, Loy, I know you worked within the system to try to do what you could, to do what could be done in regards to the termination of Dr. Moore, but it is a system that we want change, and we are still not satisfied with the outcome of her case. Faculty are increasingly concerned about their job status if they speak out because of some of the behavior we perceive from the Board of Trustees. I um, thank you, the, the work, the interactions, the, the constraints of what we do as an institution. Um, I wanna challenge those. So thank you for your time tonight. And again, Suman and uh, Veronica, um, thank you for that honor and memory. And uh, Chris, whatever we can do. We're going to do our best to help you get there. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. Item 4.6, AFT bargaining presence report for five minutes. Robert. Good evening, President Nuntak, President Nunez, esteemed board members, and Long Beach community. And I don't want to report difficulties that I've recently become aware of with the reclassification. And before you ask, I know the Personnel Commission has complete control of the study, but as a ruling governed body of the LBCC, I feel important to keep you up to date. The classifications are trying, the classified are trying to close the study, but Human Resources says, and I quote, I assume the hiring authority feels additional changes are necessary to reflect the most recent needs in the department. Please be Please be reminded that the Personnel Commission will continue to respond to routine classification requests such as, as this despite the progress of the classification study. What this statement means is deans are allowed to make additional changes to the already completed position, but not all positions, just some. This affects the compensation study. Should HR be allowed to continue making changes in already finished classification based on what they want it to be now? How is it equitable classified and their supervisors that have already signed off for years? Noina Shu assured us that the Greek class would be completed by the end of the year. We are already late in the next contract schedule classification step. Can't those changes be made during the next study? We need this one to be completed. Many of the people affected have retired or will be soon. Or is there some other reason HR is holding up completion of a no, in, no in, uh, intention of finishing the reclassification? While making their usual vague promises like every Christmas, it'll be done, it'll be done. Can the board set timelines on this process? Or maybe just freeze management pay and st uh, step increases until it's completed. I kind of guarantee it'll be done tomorrow. 
Um, that's kind of the negative portion. So the positive portion, HR is moving forward as well, making great steps and right. I'm not going to put it all down. They, they responded with a new position that they're trying to create, and I admit there's some highlights to it. Um, if you scroll down to number six, the, during the, this is a classified position that they're creating, and this is the essential duties. Uh, answer student questions and instruct students about art and designing. That's great. You're going to create classified part of teaching. And then it goes down to number 14 where it says supervise open lab. You're basically creating classified to take lab class. Now, I'm open either way. I'm all for creating classified to teach as long as the pay is equal to it. But I, I just want to say I'm, I'm happy that we're trying to fix areas that need support that the faculty apparently can't do, and they're adding these things into our new created positions, I'm willing to talk. And I want to thank them for moving forward with trying to make classified stronger at the school. I also, uh, I want to finish up by saying I also miss Baxter for a very long time. Um, as some of you may know, I'm second generation at the college. And I was a little kid running around chasing bunnies when Miss Baxter and my mom were working together. So. I go back way back in that area. I mean, I may not be the greatest person to know what she was teaching and whatever. I'm sorry. She was just, by the time I got here, she was already running the foundation and she was doing an amazing job with that. I just want to say all that time I know her and, and all the years that I've heard in my, in my family, Ms. Baxter's always been there for the college. She's been always amazing. And she's always put the college at, 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 at our heart first. That's all I can say. She's been amazing for the college. And in closing, I want to thank the trustees. I know you all have a really hard job. You always do a really good job of trying to do what's best for the college. And I want to thank you for that. And I wish you continued luck in everything you have to do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. Moving to section 5, 5.1, Superintendent President's Report. We're going to Dr. Munoz. Thank you. So I'm going to start, good evening everyone. Um, this is my report for, to the board of the for the Board of Trustees for this past month. Um, if we can start with the first slide, Dario. So I wanna just kind of build off of the beautiful words that were shared by so many tonight from our Academic Senate President Suman to those in the audience that are here. Um, and I really just kind of wanna start in my remarks tonight, um, acknowledging and upholding our campus community in memoriam of Dr. Wendy Kinnick. Um, this has been a huge loss for our college. Um, and I'm, I apologize. Uh, Dr. Kinnick was part of LBCC since 2014, as was stated earlier, um, as a faculty member for teaching art history. Um, but many of us know her beyond her teaching role. Um, she was a tremendous leader here on campus. Um, I think for those of us that work with Dr. Kennig, there isn't a part of this institution that she did not touch. Um, she was curriculum chair. She was, and I'm just gonna go off of like just my own interactions, curriculum chair um, on, the on the spot, the strategic planning process that we just went through at the college, um, accreditation. I remember sitting in the accreditation team meetings and, and as we were having conversations about the quality focus, I say, you know, Dr. Kennig's voice was there in the room and really guiding us. Um, to a better place, to a better product for accreditation in our accreditation report. Um, she was a leader for the LGBTQIA plus community here at Long Beach City College. I remember some of my first interactions with her was when I was Vice President of Student Services and we were working on the preferred name process at the college and she really lent her support to that process and spoke up in spaces of why it was so important to have a preferred name process at Long Beach City College. Um, and I can just keep going on so many committees. Um, so I, I share that because I wanna really illuminate the breadth and depth of her contributions to the institution. Um, so every student at Long Beach City College, whether you were in her class or not, um, has been touched by her and her work. Even if they didn't personally know her. And so um, with that said, I wanna let the campus community know that as we are grieving, um, we will be working with her beautiful wife, Chris, and her family to, in the coming weeks, to find the best way to support and honor her memory. Um, 
through some through a campus um, celebration of life ceremony for her. And so we will be working with the family. We want to make sure that this is done in, in alignment with um, their vision. And so, um, and, I, cause I, and I share that because I've had many people approach me and ask me, you know, Mike, um, can we, you know, um, consider naming, you know, a, a, a tree or, you know, a, a, a a, a garden on campus or can we you know what can we do because I think so many of us are grieving right now really want to to be intentional about how we honor and recognize Dr. Wendy Kennick's legacy and so that will be a priority for us and we like I said we'll be working with um, Chris as along with um, her family to make sure that we do it in a way that really honors her memory um, I do know that is does she Chris has here Chris do you mind coming up to I want to give Chris president a few and uh, trustees. I, I originally said that I didn't want to say anything, and I'm going to do my best to keep it together. Um, for a couple reasons, I wanted to say something. You know, thank you, Suman, for I didn't realize you were going to bring everybody tell everyone else to comment. So thank you. And um, you know, I, I know this is a public meeting, and you turned this into Wendy Palooza, and I'm appreciative of that. Um, um, you know, this was not her first rodeo. She got tenure at two other institutions, um, four-year institutions. And when we came here, her mother was quick to tell me, you know, she's going to move in a couple of years. And Wendy said, nope, this is my landing spot. And we did. I mean, she's been here eight years, and this was her landing spot. Man, the things that she just, she really loved the students and would really do anything, absolutely anything that anyone asked. Write a, write a letter, drive them home, um, give them a contact, anything that a, a student asked. She would always do it. And like I said, I mean, we were, not to get very personal in a public meeting, but, you know, we really felt like we were one soul that split apart. And I was here for everything. I would sit the night classes, and I would go to the gallery openings, and I would do everything because we just, this is what we did. And I sat with those kids and helped those kids as well because I was just so passionate about them learning. I mean, I had a wonderful mentor. I, I went to Indiana, Indiana University, and um, you can look her up, Dr. Phyllis Klotman. She started the Black Film Center Archive, and she let me work, let me work for her. Um, it was the only archive in the country focusing on black film, and she introduced me to her friends, Maya Angelou and Alex Haley. In fact, I met Alex Haley when we walked in the hotel room. He was zipping his fly coming out of the bathroom. So I wanted to pay it forward in the way that education and those educators helped me. And Wendy and I, we did that together. And um, like I said, I remember we never fought. And there were times, there was one time in particular, and I'm not ever going to mention the colleague's name, but the conversation started at 6.30 when we were starting dinner. And we went through dinner, and she's still on the phone. I'm cleaning up, and she's still on the phone. And it's getting to be 10 o'clock, and I'm like, babe, I'm just being collegial. She needs some help. Like, okay. But I would say things to her, and I just want you all to understand this. Because I do hope that you carry this in your heart and you will be true about it. As I said, you know, people at LBCC, they'll cry for a week. And they'll get over it. But this will destroy me if you die. So I hope that you understand how much she gave to all of you whenever you ask for anything. And I hope this goes more than a week. And I hope that, I mean, I can't tell anyone how to do business, but she was a servant leader. And she worked with anybody, no matter what their difference is because the work needed to be done. And she always knew it was about helping the students and making them the people that would go to the next step. I can't 
We just recently had dinner, recently, August, dinner with a student that was so inspired by Wendy, she got her art degree, and she's now a big wig at Disney. She confided in us that, you know, Wendy, when I was in your class, I was a homeless student living out of my car. My eight-year-old sister had been murdered, and I was having a really hard time, and you were there for me, and you didn't even know you were there for me. This woman used to take showers in Hartwell when the sprinklers went off, and she's now this, eight years later, this bigwig at Disney, and we were just boom, blown away that one art history class got to this kid. And um, I, I could tell you stories for hours, but like I said, all, all I really wanted to convey was, oh boy, she would be yelling at me for being <laughs> up here and being public because sit down, be quiet, let's go. But like I said, I just, you know, I have always had a strong work ethic she had an unbelievable work ethic because she just believed in it so much. Man, she just believed in it so much. And I just hope that it's more than a week of tears. Um, the one thing I do really want to do is one of her students in class piped up and said, well, can we do a memorial bike ride? And I said, yes, but Wendy wouldn't. It wasn't a real bike ride unless you did 10 miles. So I said, if you do 10 miles, we can do whatever you like. So there's a student that wants to do that. And um, I would like another opportunity, if you can arrange it, to have a memorial where every person can come up and say what they would like to say, because I think you know not enough people got that chance tonight. Um, her mother's in Louisville. She's 85. I had to send her home because she was sick. But um, that was her only child, and she knew how much she gave to everything all the time. I just, like I said, what Suman read was from Corrine and I, vacations and dinners and everything else. It was devoted to us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Can I acknowledge Chris, please, everyone? Thank you. Thank you, Daria. Uh, Dr. Munoz? Yes. I'm just looking, and I believe we skipped one of our uh, agenda items. I apologize. Okay, let's maybe, can we pause in the slideshow, Dario, and we're going to transition back to what items, sir? Yeah, my apologies. Uh, item 4.7, Chai Bargaining Report. And I do see Karen Roberts with us tonight. I don't know yeah, thank you. if she's here on behalf of the association. Or okay, we, 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 we skipped item 4.7, Chai Bargaining Reports. I didn't know. Okay, our apologies. Moving on, going back to the Superintendent President's Report. All right, Dario, if you can please recue the slideshow and I'll continue my report. Okay, so I am very pleased to provide you all with some great alumni news. Um, one of my mentees and LBCC alum, Robert Robles, recently informed me that he was selected as this year's recipient of the NASPA Region 6 Rising Star Award. NASPA is an international organization for student affairs administrators in higher education. This award is presented to an undergraduate student for their academic achievement. Um, ever since I met Robert a few years ago when he was still a Long Beach City College student, he literally has not stopped working to learn all he can about becoming a community college counselor. He's been a rock star connecting with Team LBCC, and he is so thankful to share this award with his other LBCC mentors, Philip Huerta, Esteban, <coughs> excuse me, Esteban Alfaro, Jose Ibarra, and Dr. Eric Becerra, and all of those in the First Year Experience Center, as well as his CSULB family. He is the college promise at its best, and I wish him all the success. Congratulations, Robert. In other news, it was my pleasure to help honor this year's Hall of Fame inductees, Dr. Ardell Avelino, Amy Valenzuela-Mir, and Dr. Blas Villalobos. 
And for the first time, the foundation has also honored individuals and organizations with distinguished service awards. That is the mayor of Long Beach, Dr. Robert Garcia, the Rotary Club of Long Beach, and the Long Beach Rotary, excuse me, Long Beach Rotary Scholarship Foundation, and Dean Randy Tutorp. Congratulations to all, and great job to our Long Beach City College Foundation for another successful Hall of Fame event. So we had homecoming, and it was an, a great event, so let's keep talking about all these wonderful celebrations. Um, so we had homecoming a few weeks ago, and here's a video recapping homecoming 2022. such as root beer chugging contest, musical chairs. We had our LBCC cheer squad perform. We have some of our LBCC football players here ready to be interviewed. And uh, free pizza, most of all, free pizza. This Saturday is going to be obviously a great end event with a game, but free game. You know, they've got free barbecue for the students out there. They've got a bunch of booths, a bunch of competitive activities and events for the students to participate in. It should be a great LBCC family affair to bring everybody together here on campus. It's, it's, it's great to see so many students back on campus um, this semester, you know, because obviously we haven't had students on campus really for over the last basically almost two years. So it's great to see. Hopefully everybody comes out, goes through those events, eats some phenomenal free barbecue, and then comes out and sees us play, uh, play Saturday night. So excited for homecoming. I got to be at midfield today with Superintendent President Dr. Mike Munoz for the coin toss. Uh, he did an amazing job. And today at halftime, we will have our first masquerade ball since the pandemic. Homecoming court coming to you soon. So hopefully that video gave you a little, little taste of the electrifying energy that was at homecoming. I want to just give a big shout out to our student affairs team for organizing the tailgate and the um, tailgate party and the halftime program for our campus community, as well as our foundation hosted a VIP reception. So again, great effort by our Viking football team. So let's talk about eSports. This past Monday, we held our very first watch party for our new eSports team, and we witnessed our brand new team beat the undefeated Cal State University Dominguez Hills Toros. More than 70 people attended watching the in person, watching in person in the Clax multi-purpose room, while hundreds of people watched the action as it live streamed on LBCC's Twitch channel. The program just launched in September and we are already making a names for ourselves. There's rumors that we might even be bumped up to Division One esports because we're doing so well. I'm so excited to see how far our team climbs this season. Let's give it up for our esports team. So Long Beach City College was honored to receive the International City Theater's James Ackerman Crystal Arts and Humanitarian Award last week. We were recognized for our contribution to both the community and the arts. Continuing on with celebrations, we just finished celebrating Latinx Heritage Month and we have a video tonight highlighting our activities. Bienvenidos, welcome everybody to this year's Latinx Heritage Month kickoff event at Long Beach City College. This is a special Latinx Heritage kickoff because just at yesterday's board meeting, the Board of Trustees approved the resolution to recognize Latinx Heritage Month this year and every year. Our resolutions are a statement of policy of the institution. This makes, takes an official statement of record that this is where we stand as Long Beach City College. But events like this bring us together to build not just our campus, but our larger Long Beach community. And during our kickoff event, we really just want to elevate the, diverse, uh, the diversity among the Latino community. So we do have Salvadorian food, we have some Aztec dancers kicking it off. We're all indigenous from the tip of Alaska all the way down to the tip of South America. We're indigenous peoples. At the same time, it's an opportunity to share what it's like to identify as a Latinx with other groups that blend with us to make up our diverse community here at LBCC. Hi, my name is Maya Quintilla. I'm the author of The Cha Cha Files. I'm going to share my writing process and some poetry and stories with you. So we have so much to learn from one another and that's, I think, one of the key messages we want to deliver with all of our cultural heritage programs is that 
our diversity, our heritage, our histories. Um, there's a lot of um, pride and strength in them. This is Latino Heritage Month, so you hear lots of dancing music, and our students have been super excited to bring their art and showcase it, but I think it's really good for students to connect and to share their work, especially with you know deans and other administrators that are on campus that are present, and that really helps us to see the value of art. This theme embraces what we hope will always be our goal, to honor where we came from, to celebrate our diversity, and to learn about the many contributions of our Latinx community. We have a resource fair of uh, on-campus and off-campus resources for our students, and later on we'll have a showcase of some salsa and bachata. Rhythm is your voice. Let her speak. Yang beat. Document the story. Let her speak. Um, bass boom. Let them speak. In the circle, let us speak. Habla, habla, habla. The body remembers. Thank you. <clears throat> so the purpose of these events are just really for our students to feel seen, heard, and loved through their college experience, to know that they belong here, that they're welcome here, and that they don't have to check their identity at the door. They can bring all who they are with them when they come to our college campus. Thank you again to everyone who worked hard organizing all of the Latinx Heritage Month events. And now we move right into celebrating Filipino American History Month. This week we had our very first Filipino American History Month kick kickoff with an event at LAC. There will be a Filipinx meet and greet on October 25th as well as other upcoming events. Please check our LBCC calendar for more info. In September, the Labor Center held a union meet and greet. Students, employees, and our trustees heard from a number of union representatives um, to hear more about unions. This was a networking opportunity and it was followed by a panel discussion. You can see some of the great photos from the event. And this was held at the Pacific Coast campus. We also participated in what was called Collegiality in Action. And Academic Senate President Suman Mudanuri and I invited colleagues to a Collegiality in Action visit last month with the Academic Senate for California Community College President Virginia Jenny May and Community League of California President Larry Galizio. Our two guests provided an overview of state law, state regulation, and guidelines con concerning participatory governance. Um, I've recently been invited to participate in a number of conferences and panels, and I had the opportunity to join other Seal of Excellencia certified institutions in a meeting with U.S. Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona in Washington, D.C. I was proud to represent Long Beach City College and share about the work that we're doing here that's advancing Latinx student success. I want to invite you all to two upcoming events that are coming up, celebrating Dia de los Muertos on November 1st. We will have an event at the Liberal Arts Campus starting with a family movie night at 4 p.m. at the M Building, followed by a Dia de los Muertos procession to the E Building. And on Saturday, November 5th, LBCC is one of the sponsors of the Dia de los Muertos Parade and Festival in Long Beach. We will be participating in the parade, so please check your email to RSVP if you wanna join us. And for both of these events, wear regalia and la calavera makeup, um, if you like. I would also like to recognize, and I know CC mentioned this, um, two LBCC employees on their retirement. Congratulations to lead custodian Richard Estacio for 27 years of service, and congratulations to Adam Terrioca, who after 22 years of service retired as the power tool lab technician and part-time faculty member. Congratulations to them both. And you, in closing, you might have heard that there are a large number of Vikings will be traveling the 710 freeway this weekend to East Los Angeles College. Um, not only will we be cheering on our awesome Viking football team, but there's also a little side agreement at stake between me and ELAC President Roman. Here's a video to explain a little bit more. Make sure the closed captions are on too, Daria. This is ELEC President Alberto Roman. And I'm Long Beach City College President Dr. Mike Munoz. I hope you can join us on Saturday, October 22nd at 6 p.m. for our home football game against the Long Beach City Vikings. We place a friendly wager that when the Huskies defeat the Vikings, 
President Munoz will have to wear ELA gear at the LBCC campus. Um, no. When the Vikings win, you'll be the one wearing our gear on the ELAC campus. It's on. We'll see what happens on the field. Best, Best of, of luck, luck to all the players, players on, on both teams. teams. Go, Go Vikings! So as you can see, it's on. So we hope you come out, support the Vikings so that we can take down the Huskies at East Los Angeles College and make President Roman wear the red and black colors. So lastly, um, please join me in wishing Dario de Santiago a very happy birthday today. So let's just happy give Dario a big happy birthday love as well as a happy belated birthday to Dr. Alicia Kirkwood, whose birthday was, I believe, on Tuesday. So I want to wish them both a very happy birthday. And this concludes my report for this month. Thank you, and go Vikings. Thank you, Dr. Munoz. Moving to item 5.2, uh, this is the new board policy and administrative procedure. This is chapter three, uh, general institution, board policies 3100. This is the second reading. And administrative procedure 3100, which is information item, uh, this is part of our ongoing updates of board policies and compliance with AACCJ and work with the California College League uh, Policy Procedure Service. Uh, it's recommended the Board of Trustees adopt the new policy uh, 3100, which is about organizational structures. This is an action item we'll need a motion and a second for. So moved. Second. Motion by uh, Trustee Malalulu, second by Trustee Baxter. Any discussion on the, the new policy? Seeing and hearing none, we'll do a roll call vote for uh, Vice President Chico, who's remotely participating. Student Starting Trustee with. Hernandez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Herlinda Chico? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduak Cho Intuk? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. All right. Uh, the new policy is adopted. Moving to section six, these are presentations. A uh, 15 minute presentation with up to 25 minutes of comments and questions by board trustees, about uh, five minutes per trustee. Uh, this is the end of the state legislative session. We ended the two year uh, cycle this past August 31st. And this is information on an update from uh, Long Beach City College Board uh, to the Board of Trustees of our uh, 2022 positions, bills related to higher education, our positions on them. And uh, Vice President Infusio will be presenting tonight. So, pass the baton. Thank you, Board President. Um, yes, this is my first presentation to you from the side of the, uh, the uh, bench here, so um, I'm thrilled to be here. I was asked to present to you um, the bills that have passed um, that have also failed or been vetoed um, in this most recent legislative session. Um, while you have the presentation in front of you and attached to board docs, um, you also have a memo that provides additional hyperlinks and information about the bills that we've been tracking. Um, so as I said, this will provide you just the bills that we've been following. The deadline for the governor to sign was Friday, September 30th. So this is um, a summary of what has happened over the course of the session. So first I'll start with the chaptered bills or those that have been signed by the governor. Um, AB 102, um, this was a bill that we supported and it expands the CCAP programs, which are a type of dual enrollment program. This is something that we've um, supported and uh, was a, a great plus for LBCC. This was signed by the governor. Um, AB 1491, um, this was regarding carryover funding for the California Adult Education Funds. Um, those are the funds that we receive into the Long Beach Adult Ed Consortia with the Long Beach School for Adults and LBCC. This has never, carryover has never been an issue for us, but if it was, this would um, uh, address that. AB 1655, um, May Juneteenth, a holiday, a recognized holiday. This has also been added to our calendar here at LBCC. We supported this and it was signed by the governor. SB 972, um, this makes training partnerships with public safety agencies more beneficial to colleges. Um, we had initially opposed it given our lack of programs um, and uh, the way it would in, not be uh, equitable across all colleges, but this is something that we're exploring again, so we did it. Um, reverse or withdraw our opposition to it. SB 1141, 
Um, we were watching this as it relates to our SBDC um, and the new grant we've received to support micro businesses. Um, it was introduced by our local Senator Lena, Lena Gonzalez as a way to support street food vendors. And so this is something we were tracking um, and the governor did sign it into law. So we're happy to continue to work with her office to support that part of our community. <laughs> SB 1141, um, this was a cleanup bill to expand access to undocumented students um, to in-state tuition rates. So we supported this. Um, it will allow from it for additional resources to go to students um, due to the ability to leverage in-state in tuition rates instead of out-of-state. Um, this has been signed into law as well. So now we'll move to the vetoed or the failed bills. So these are bills that the governor either did not sign, vetoed, or maybe didn't make it out of um, committee or um, for a vote. AB 75, um, this would have been a, a very wonderful um, benefit to the system, a $12 billion bond on the ballot for K-12 um, and community college construction and modernization. We supported this, um, but it, it failed to leave the education committee, unfortunately. Um, EB 1040, um, this builds on prior legislation um, for ethnic studies, um, and uh, LBCC is way ahead of the game. We obviously have heard more about the work that we're doing here. Um, this, however, even though we supported it, didn't make it out of the Senate. AB 1746. Um, we had asked that this bill be fully funded or $400 million statewide um, and in Prop 98 funds. Um, otherwise, this would have been a cost to the system that really could not have been bared. AB 1746, um, this uh, was supported by us. Uh, although this bill in particular did not make it, um, the language was incorporated into the trailer bill. Um, this is funding for an expansion of the Cal Grant program. Um, the quote that you see there is something that um, our staff here helped to um, provide feedback directly to the author on and, and to express our support of it. Um, so this was incorporated into the, the budget bill, but um, it's unclear if it's going to be funded. Um, it's subject to state general fund availability over the multi-year forecast. So we'll have to watch and see how much funding is allocated to this in the future. Um, AB 1752, um, this uh, was something that we were watching. Um, also, it did not make it out of committee. AB 1856, um, this also was something that was on our watch list. Um, the governor did veto it, um, and he referenced the, um, the fund cost pressures that uh, this would put on the state, and that's why he decided to veto it. AB 1919, um, this was something we also supported and, and reached out to the author's uh, office on. Um, this would have provided additional funding for transit pass, and we were also looking at this in relation to um, students on um, uh, Catalina and their ability to use the um, ferry that goes back and forth. Um, while this was something we supported, the governor did veto it. We suspect it was because of the cost, however, um, the author is planning on introducing it again next year. So we'll continue to support it and also um, provide that feedback. And then lastly, SB 22, um, you know, while this sounded good um, to be able to provide finances for school facilities, um, the issue that we had was that it was very inequitable. And so the money that was allocated um, was uh, equal to each of the, um, the educational groups. Uh, however, as you broke it up by campus, um, $2 billion at 116 community colleges is very different than $2 billion for 10 um, U of C campuses. And so we were asking that there be a more equitable distribution of these funds, um, but it didn't make it out of Senate. So that is uh, a synopsis of the bills that we were tracking um, in this legislative session, and I'm happy to answer any questions as I can. Trustee Malu. Melissa, thank you, uh, Vice President Infacino, pardon me. Thank you for that great report. Um, one question and one comment. Um, I'm glad that the, um, um, gosh, I don't remember, it's the last one that you showed or, or next to last one, that one. Yep. Nope, that one. I'm glad that that failed. We had a robust discussion about that a few board meetings ago and um, I know that you asked us to get involved and um, send letters and 
make calls. So I, I am happy that um, whether it was our involvement or someone else's, that that worked because I thought that was terribly unfair um, to allocate equal funding to institutions, um, especially when we all serve different populations. But the one that I um, am a little disappointed in, and I'd just like to know if you know why, is, is the public transportation one. Was, were, is there another reason that was given? Because I thought, you know, especially with our partnership with Long Beach Transit, that we were a great model for the state to follow. It, do you happen to know what happened? Yeah, with there that? was no veto message. Um, however, the the governor's comments with relation to other bills really did. Um, he specifically said bills with significant fiscal impact, such as um, this measure and others, should be considered and accounted for as part of the annual budget process. For these reasons, I cannot sign this bill. So. You know, we suspect it's all related to the cost. So, um, you know, the author will introduce it again next year, and I think we can probably have conversations further with the governor's office and, and the author to see if we can build support and make the case for why it's worth the investment. Um, it's interesting that the language that was used is that it should be a budget item, mm. because I think that that gives us ammunition when we head up there, when we send a team in January to Sacramento and then when we lobby for the budget, because um, if, if he deferred it back to the budget, I think we need to capitalize on his mm -hmm. words and make that clear ask at that time. So thank you very much for that. Very, very good report. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from trustees? Trustees, yeah. Thank you, Interim Vice President Enficino, and congratulations on your first presentation. Um, just for the benefit of the public, if you can please, I'm not sure if I saw the definition of the institutional vernacular you're using on chaptered. What does that mean? Sure, I will go back to the first slide. Um, is this what you were referring to? Right, so that means it's been passed essentially, right? And signed into law. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? Vice President Chico? I guess you have your virtual hand up. Okay, so you're hearing none. Uh, thank you for the presentation, and we'll move on to the next item, uh, Section 7, Board of Trustees. Uh, 7.1 is a resolution to open, resource, open education resources, OER. Um, attached, this is an action item. Uh, attached is a draft of the resolution. This is the Board of Trustees. Uh, adopt resolution 101922D, uh, open resource education as submitted. Uh, attached is a copy of the resolution. This will need a motion and a second to discuss. So moved. Motion by Trustee Zia. Second. Second by Trustee Baxter. Uh, student Trustee Hernandez, do you want to say anything to this? Thank you, President Intec. Um, so I'm very uh, happy and glad that this, uh, you know, worked on this resolution. Um, I think this is going to benefit a lot of our students here, right? Uh, a lot of populations that are facing um, financial situation, right, with textbooks um, bearing at a high cost. Um, I think this is just going to be a, a road or a, a process that's just going to benefit um, everyone around, and not only uh, students, but also uh, instructors and professors here on campus. Um, so I'm just happy that, you know, we were able to put this on the agenda. Thank you. Trustee Baxter? Yes. Uh, I just want to call, thank you, President Tech. I just want to call attention to two people who were very involved in OER from the very beginning. And one is uh, someone who's deceased, Dr. Howard Shiflett, who was a distinguished uh, professor of uh, geology. And, oh, it's got to be 15 years ago he started this campaign. And then the second one was Doug Otto, who is now on the Long Beach Unified School District Board, who also was uh, a big champion of this, and, and uh, I just wanted to recognize them. Thank you. Oops, sorry. Thank you for taking a moment to also thank um, uh, student trustee Hernandez. I know 
this is your first policy action and working in partnership together that uh, the importance of the student voice and uh, appreciate your feedback and drafting it and if you read through the whereas as it talks about uh, this you know the rising cost of student loans and student loan debt across America the advantages of community colleges as far as saving students funds uh, and then some of the rising costs of textbooks it's almost nine percent of the cost of admission at or total cost of attendance at UCs is now textbooks and we were doing much of this work already and in discussions and review we didn't have a policy in the books uh, and the, the goal of this is to um, eventually work towards hopefully maybe next semester because we have to go through our our process a deliberative uh, campus process uh, to come up with a policy about you know we do take an affirmative uh, position as an institution and support uh, open resource uh, books and text uh, free textbooks um, I just want to recognize, and I do want to say thank you to Suma Mudinari for getting the academic senate review and making sure there's an explicit clause in the resolution that this shall not infringe on academic freedom of our faculty members. And so, um, you know, we're, we're make sure we're, we get that in there early so there's no misunderstandings about the intention of the policy. Uh, any other trustee, Vice President Chico, trustees here? Yeah, I, I wanted to also commend um, our student trustee for taking on this leadership. Um, and then also just um, what a, a great, great policy uh, platform to um, launch uh, your efforts. I also want to recognize that um, former trustee and our uh, personnel commissioner, trustee um, Jeff Kellogg, was one of the people who led this effort and was a strong advocate for uh, open education resources and he deserves um, to be lauded as well. Thank you. Any other uh, comments or questions? Seeing and hearing none, we'll do a roll call, uh, Secretary Reese. Student Trustee Hernandez. Aye. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Herlinda Chico? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Budawak Joe Intak? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. Excuse me, the uh, resolution is adopted. Moving to item 7.2, resolution authorizing teleconference of open meetings pursuant to AB 361. <coughs> Excuse me. This is uh, um, an action item. Uh, this is the uh, open meetings resolution we adopt each month for the next 30 days. It's recommended the Board of Trustees adopt resolution 10922A, authorizing teleconference open meetings pursuance to AB 361. I have a motion and a second. So move. Second. All right, I have a motion by um, Trustee Baxter, second by Trustee Zia. Any discussion on uh, the resolution. See in here and then we'll take a roll call vote, Secretary Reese. Student Trustee Hernandez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Herlinda Chico? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uruak Jo Intak? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. Right, the resolution is adopted. Moving to item 7.4, revised 2023 board meeting schedule. Uh, this is an action item as well to recommend the board of trustees approve the revised 2023 board schedule as submitted. There's changes due to some conflicts of interest, I mean conflicts of scheduling on March 15th, uh, 2023 and July 12th, 2023. So we need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Motion by Vice President Chico, seconded by Trustee Zia. Any discussion on the uh, agenda? We'll go to Trustee Baxter and then Trustee Zia. Yes, thank you, President Indic. Um, I would like to know the rationale for changing the meeting date from March 29th to March 15th. And the reason um, I'm asking is that um, I uh, have a business that involves travel and I specifically look at the calendar when I plan my trips. And I have a trip that leaves March 14th um, to the 21st. So I purposely made sure that I did not conflict 
with the board schedule. So I'd just like to know why it was changed, please. Yeah, Dr. Munoz. I can speak to that, Dr. Baxter. Um, so typically, I think it was two months ago in August that we um, approved the calendar. Mm -hmm. And at the time, um, we try our best to look at and, pre and to predict the different conferences and things that might conflict with the schedule. Um, recently, um, we received notification about the Wheelhouse Institute. And so I'll be participating on behalf of the college in the Wheelhouse Institute. And they have uh, mandatory dates that um, basically conflict with the board meeting. And so I would not be able to participate in the Wheelhouse Institute at the same time being able to be at the board meeting. So that's why we brought forward these dates. And unfortunately, at the time when the schedule was looked at in August, those dates had not been provided yet. And again, the change in date from July 19th. The it's the same thing. They're both um, the required dates to participate in the wheeled house. Yeah, I had the same question. Um, and, you know, this isn't the first time we keep changing the board meetings based on our um, superintendent president's schedule or conference um, attendance that comes up. Um, nothing against uh, your schedule or your schedule constraints that come up capriciously, Dr. Munoz, but I think it would be prudent for you to designate it, and just like previous superintendents have, um, that you're allowed to miss board meetings and um, you can have a designee rather than changing the um, calendar year that we set, set up for meeting dates prior hand. Um, just my suggestion, and, and if, if, uh, I, I mean that uh, with good intent, um, and because I'm, Dr. Baxter and I are the longest serving board members on this board, we've seen that happen with previous superintendents, that they would have delegates or des designees in their absence. Any other discussion on the minor? See and hear none, let's go to a roll call vote. Student Trustee Hernandez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Nay. Herlinda Chico? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduak Cho Intuk? Aye. Sunny Zia? Nay. Ayes have it, and the board schedule has been modified. Moving to consent agenda, this is section eight. Uh, going to 8.1, any item may be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately if a member of the board of trustees so requests. Uh, it should be noted, and I did make a statement at the beginning of the meeting, that item 8.13, bond contract amendments for contract number 2208.7.2 has already been removed from uh, the agenda this, this night, or tonight, and it will be remedied and added to a, f a future board meeting. Um, and so that's not in the consent agenda tonight. Any items to remove? Trustee Zia. Uh, President Intuck, just a point of clarification. Is the entire, because there's three, um, I believe there's two items on that 8.13. Is the, are both contracts being pulled and deferred? Which one? So can we vote on the other one? And we did, we did talk to Bob Raposo before the, the meeting tonight, and I believe it's just the P2S. Contract? Okay. okay yes, so we'll just the B2S. Is that's going to be the one that deferred or? Def that one will be deferred. Might it be possible to vote on the other item? If it's the pleasure of the board? I just don't know how we can do this. Maybe we can vote on it and then um, say with the, uh, with the exception of contract number 2208.7.2. And I'm happy to make the motion. Yeah, I, I think it might be uh, okay, but we've already announced it twice that we pulled the entire item, and that was the direction given before the board meeting to pull the entire item. So, uh, you know, I think we should just stick with what's already been, been said, even though we may be able to do that. Is there any, uh, back to item 8.1, any items that folks would like to remove from the consent agenda? Seeing and hearing none, we'll move to 8.2, uh, 
approval of the consent agenda. This is uh, an action item. We need a motion and a second to adopt the rest of the items of section eight. So move. Second. Motion by Trustee Baxter, second by Vice President Chico. Any discussion on the consent agenda? Seeing and hearing none, can we do a roll call vote? Student Trustee Hernandez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Herlinda Chico? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduak Joe Intuck? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. The consent agenda has been adopted. We're now moving to Section 9, Human Resources. Uh, 9.1 is a new and revised board policy and administrative procedure, Chapter 7, Human Resources and Administrative Procedure 7170, an information item. This is only for information, and it's uh, um, an administrative procedure, which we, we don't vote on, and this is related to remote work. So this is the first time that it's uh, being sunshined uh, for the public. Attached is a copy of the draft uh, administrative procedure. And if there's not any questions or comments from the board, then we'll move on to the next item. Uh, Section 10, Academic Senate, 10.1, we have no items tonight. Uh, Section 11, Academic Affairs, we do have 11.1, .1, Revised Academic Calendar, 2024-2025. This is an action item. It's a recommend the Board of Trustees uh, approve the revised 2024-2025 academic calendar is submitted. Uh, there was uh, a removal, it was reviewed and approved by the Calendar Committee on October 6th, all the constituency groups. Uh, in accordance with district policy and the calendar has 175 days of instructions as required by Title V. Includes all mandated holidays, flex days, and additional board declared holidays. Uh, this is an action I will need a motion in a second. So move. Motion by Trustee Baxter. Second. Second by Trustee Zia. Any discussion on the revised calendar? Can we ask, uh, just a question for staff, any new items on there that is noteworthy? It's, I did see the state adopted Juneteenth now as an official holiday. Is that one of the items revised or is there any other items that were revised? So my understanding is um, the Juneteenth holiday has already been included in the academic calendar. The revisions were more to provide clarity around the f obligated flex days. That's my understanding. Great. Any other questions or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, we'll take a roll call vote. Student Trustee Hernandez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Herlinda Chico? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uruak Joe Intuck? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. All right, the calendar is adopted. Moving to Section 12, 12.1, Long Beach Police Department, one year contract. Uh, this is an action item. There will be a motion and a second. That's recommended to the Board of Trustees, authorize Vice President, Business Services, or designee to enter into an executed contract as submitted. Contract number 99816.9 with the City of Long Beach for security services for the term of October 1st, 2022 through September 30th, 2023, paid from unrestricted general funds. I'll need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Motion by Trustee Zia, second by Trustee Baxter. Any discussion on item? Attached is a copy of the contract. Seeing and hearing none, we'll take a roll call vote. Student Trustee Hernandez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Herlinda Chico? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uruak Joe Intak? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. All right, the contract has been adopted. Moving to 12.2, this is the 2021-2022 CCFS 311 Annual Financial and Budget Report, uh, also called the Gain Limit. Uh, it's an uh, action item that's going to require a motion in a second. It's recommended the Board of Trustees approve the 2021-2022 CCFS-311 Annual Financial and Budget re uh, Report, including the 2022-2023 Appropriation Limit for Long Beach Community College District an authorized transmittal of the report to the Chancellor's Office of California Community Colleges as submitted. Uh, there is a copy of the report and additional uh, ed code references, and we'll, we'll need a motion in a second to advance. So moved. Second. Motion by Trustee Zia, second by Trustee Baxter. Any discussion on the financial report to the Chancellor's Office? Seeing and hearing none, we'll take a roll call vote. 
Student Trustee Hernandez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Herlinda Chico? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduak Joe Intuck? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. All right, the resolution or the report has been adopted to advance to the Chancellor's Office. Moving to Section 13, Student Services 13.1, we have no items today. Uh, we now move into reports from Board of Trustees, item 14.1. This is five minutes per trustee. Uh, we'll start with Trustee Ma'alulu tonight. Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm gonna have to talk really fast. Dario, are you ready? Okay, good. So uh, starting with our last board meeting, this was a very long month in between. On Thursday the 15th, I attended the Latinx Heritage Month and enjoyed the Salvadorian pupusas, and I'd like to request that next year's Latinx Heritage Month, we serve Honduran baleadas. I'll make sure we have those. Um, I will defer to the photos that you provided, Dr. Munoz, for some of these events. On Sunday the 18th, I was at the Grape Expectations fundraiser event benefiting the Long Beach Public Library, which is always a really nice, well-done event. On Monday the 19th, the Labor Center uh, grand opening event for this academic school year, uh, very well attended. I was uh, delighted with the panel and the contributions and the information that they shared. Thursday the 22nd, congratulations to this year's uh, Hall of Fame inductees, another well done event by our wonderful foundation who just always goes above and beyond. On Saturday the 24th, um, this photo that you see here is actually after the event I'm going to discuss. I'd like to congratulate Dr. Mike Munoz for receiving the NAACP Award for Education at this year's event. I would also like to commend uh, Dr. Naomi Rainey Pearson on uh, the brunch idea, which I think everyone really enjoyed. Very well done. And then I had to leave early because my commission, the Commission on Youth and Families, um, who introduced the youth forum to the community several years ago, and this year it expanded uh, bigger than ever to the Billie Jean King Library. And here are three photos because Long Beach City College was a part of the youth forum with three different tables, three different events, and I'm so proud, and it, it's so um, such a great feeling to walk into, well, it was outdoors, but you know what I mean, to walk to walk into the forum that was outdoors and see Long Beach City College prominently on display. They were very busy, lots of guests stopped by to glean from our information and our table hosts. On the 26th, we had a special Board of Trustee meetings. And then on the 30th, I had an opportunity to present at a regional Naleo event. And Dario, there's my badge there. For the Latino Workforce and Economic Opportunity, I presented both from the perspective of community colleges training our Latino student population for jobs of the future, not just green jobs, not just automated jobs, but just um, educating them on the opportunities that they could have access to and resources. And I was joined, here we go, uh, we have uh, uh, Vice President Melissa Enfocino, and, and uh, excuse me, I should correct myself, Interim Vice President Melissa Enfocino, and then we have Jeffrey Velasquez, who represented our Automotive Career Technical Education Department. I was so proud to have them there. On Saturday the 1st, um, the, this is another organization I've been a part of. Finally, after decades of work, the Latino Cultural Center opened its doors at the Cesar Chavez Park uh, in downtown Long Beach together with the Barrio de Long Beach, and I was the inspirational speaker. I hope I was able to inspire somebody. It was the day after my 30-year high school reunion, so I don't know how much inspiration I was able to provide that day, but that evening I was with my Viking family at uh, homecoming, and again, it was another wonderful event, and it was great seeing the football team out there competing. On Saturday the 8th, Dario, cue up that next photo. Oh, that's the one at um, the Latino Cultural Center grand opening. Again, Long Beach City College was there, and I'm so grateful for our community and our support. 
On the 8th, I attended um, the first of this year, Performing Arts uh, with our theater department. That is the closing scene of De Donde, which is a 30-year-old play that was written three decades ago talking about immigration in this country. And it, it was as if it was written yesterday because the topics and the themes and the subject were just as relevant today as it was 30 years ago. Kudos to um, Tony and his wonderful staff. You guys did a fantastic job. And, uh, you know, I don't need to say break a leg because you all obviously did. Uh, that's Dr. Carrero in the theater department. On the 12th, Wednesday the 12th, I was at the International City Theater and I learned something new. I didn't know that ICT started at Long Beach City College. And I was blown away by that gem of a fact. And congratulations to us. Dr. Munoz stood on the stage and accepted an award on behalf of the district. The next day, Thursday the 13th, I attended another labor center event at the Pacific Coast Campus where we did a voter registration drive where we were able to partner with different community groups to make sure our students in our community, not just our students, but also our community, were able to register to vote. And then Dario, you've got that other picture. I just want you guys to see yeah, a minute. Frank Perez's picture. Can I please go? I've got one more. We're at your five minute mark. I'm talking fast. Can I please continue? Only advance if we take a vote of the whole board. Please, can Would I finish? Make a motion and a I second to, one more. to give additional time per the board rules. <laughs> I'm sorry. I move to, to provide more time. Oh, thank you. We have a motion. Is there a second? I second. Okay, motion is second. <laughs> I'll be quick. Well, I'm quick. We have a motion and a second. How, how much? No, no, no. I, I, I thought I made the motion. Uh, no, I what, point of order. Uh, oh, I would have been done going, by now. Just going back to the uh, uh, the motion. How much time? I, th I thought Vice President Chico made two, the motion. Two more events. Two more minutes? Yeah. Okay. Two more events. No. 30 seconds. Okay, well, we do have a motion on the floor already with the second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, if there's no discussion, we'll, we'll have to take a roll call vote because we do have a virtual participant. <laughs> so um, I'm sorry. Secretary Reese? Student Trustee Hernandez? Aye. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Herlinda Chico? Aye. Vivian Malalu? Aye. <laughs> Uruakjo Entak? Aye. Sunny Zia? I thank you to my colleagues. Been, we'll go two more minutes. Go ahead. I would have made an executive decision. I was almost done. Okay. Um, I just want to commend Dr. Frank Perez. See what's behind me here. This is his vision to transform that driveway at the Pacific Coast campus into an area which was more visible from the street, which generated more interest and more participation from the community. So that was, um, you know, we've used that space before for the Latino Authors event, and we used it for the Labor Center, we used it for the voter registration, so it was great. The last event this past Saturday um, was the MOLA uh, Museum of Latin American Art um, Annual Gala, uh, which Cordoba Corporation was honored, and that is one of our contractors who has really done a great job beautifying our campus. And then I'm very proud to share that finally, after seven years, the Pacific Coast Swap Meet had its ribbon cutting on Sunday morning. Uh, we had 5,000 guests, 230 vendors, 70% were women-owned minority. Um, a lot of them were businesses that were impacted during COVID. We generated a lot of money that we cannot quantify because we have no way of knowing how much each vendor made. but. Everybody was very happy, and right now we're on the calendar every two Sundays, every other Sunday. Hopefully we can have it every Sunday. It was clean, it was classy, it was organized, it was safe. Thank you to facilities. Thank you to our administration for making that happen. And I have one video that I wanna close with. Check this out. Oh, it's blurry. <laughs> this is um, almost all the board members, and this is at MOLA. And it's, it's not always bad. Sometimes we have fun together. And there's our board doing one of these 360 video things um, representing in the community. Thank you to my colleagues for allowing the time. I was going fast. Right on time. Thank you. Moving.
Trustees, Trustee Zia for her five minute report. Thank you. Um, before I get started, I'm not going to go through all the uh, events for the past couple months. Um, I want to echo the sentiment of the public about Dr. Jenny Baxter. I've known her for the past eight and a half years since I've been elected and before then. And I just want to say I have not seen anyone as kind-hearted and just true and dedicated to students was Dr. Baxter and someone who's always reaching out, always looking for opportunities to collaborate. She nominated Trustee Malaulu for CCEJ Award. I remember that. She got me involved with CCEJ, Rotary, and many other causes. Um, she's a stalwart for our community and a beacon of hope for our students. And I just want, I stand with the public who spoke tonight and echo their sentiments about her integrity and honor and years of service to this organization. It is truly an honor to know you, Ginny, and call you my friend and partner. Sometimes doing the right thing condemns you to be in the minority, but it's still the right thing. And I really appreciate who you are and what you do for this institution. With that, I'd like to dedicate tonight to the men and women, uh, brave men and women of Iran who are fighting for freedom led by women and a revolution that they're um, at the forefront of. Um, of it's, it's, un, it's heartbreaking for me. For those of you who don't know a little bit about me, um, I'm a proud Iranian American who fled a war-torn Iran in my early childhood seeking refuge with my family in the US. I subsequently had the honor of living in Iran for high school. I went to parochial school, high school, and, co and for college between 1991 to 1999. Um, it was hard to, it's really hard to express the profundity and depth of anguish and pain I saw in Iran and experienced, but I'll try here. In my junior year in high school, similar to Mahsa Amini, who was killed and is now the symbol for women's rights, life and freedom. My friend, a 16-year-old Bahar of Ujjani, was killed at the hands of this regime because she wasn't wearing a piece of cloth on her head properly. And during my last hours in Iran in 1999, I witnessed my classmates be beaten to death and imprisoned because they stood up for secular freedom. Leaving with a broken heart, I vowed to those I left behind that I would make sure their cry for freedom is heard in every interaction I have upon my return to the US. Audrey Hepburn once said, humanitarian means human welfare. I'm responding to human suffering. And finally, that's what politics should be. That is why I got in this arena of politics and public service to respond to human suffering. Those brave Iranians fighting for freedom in 1999, again in 2009, and now in 2022 are my inspiration of doing what I do every day in their honor to respond to their suffering and in honor of all those who are forgotten, friendless, voiceless in my community, constituents and country here at, the, at home. I stand before you with infinite pride and inspiration for their integrity, fidelity, and bravery. In the words of Gil Scott Heron, the revolution will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised. The revolution will be live. This is indeed a revolution that is live and happening before our eyes in Iran. A revolution led by a brave young woman fighting for basic human rights much like our founding fathers who rose a class against tyranny of King George. The brave Iranian people are fighting with their lives in pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness for themselves and their posterity. They are fighting to regain their secular freedom as they once had it. I appreciate the, our superintendent sending a message to our campus community, and I've asked for a message of solidarity by way of a resolution 
to let them know that they are not alone, that we stand with them and hear their roar and cry for freedom, that we are with them as they give a one-finger salute to the dictator, the dictatorship and oppression. A protest or a resolution of solidarity may not change the world, but it adds its fraction to the odds of change. There is value in a single step towards justice, and one step leads to another. Thank you, that's time. May I have 30 more seconds to finish my uh, remarks? 30 seconds, go ahead. Thank you. May the beautiful people of Iran be free at last. May they be free from suffering, and finally, in our lifetime, secure the blessings of liberty to themselves and their posterity. At the end of the day, the oppressed outnumber the oppressors. Here's to the Masa Aminis, the Bahara Vujanis, Nida Agha Sultan, Serena Asma al Zadez, the oppressed and all those who stand with them and fight for them. May we live to see the time where women no longer have to fight over their choice, over their bodies, over having agency, and may we see justice finally prevail. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Vice President Chico for her five minute report. Vice President Chico, can you hear us? Great, thank you. I am going to pull up my notes. I can't really see the um, slideshow uh, or the, the screen, so I'll do my best uh, to kind of follow along uh, and make this quick as well, because I have quite a bit. Um, this month was a, another productive month. The day following our last board meeting, Dr. Munoz and I attended the National Hispanic Community College Conference, where we presented again on the framework for reconciliation. Next slide. Um, I was so happy to see our own Esteban Alfaro in attendance as well, um, building on his professional development. Um, and one of the workshops that I attended was Latinas in Higher Education. It was a safe space for many of us to share experiences that were sadly similar. When we as Latinas use our voice and speak up for ourselves, many of us experienced the same thing, an immediate backlash undermined and quickly vilified characterized as aggressive, disruptive, irritated. And these words, uh, the words that we use can have a lasting effect. And I hope that we all commit to doing better and uphold the voices of all women. On that note, I, I'd like to acknowledge our Iranian sisters putting their lives on the line to fight for their basic human rights. And I and many of us in the community stand in solidarity with you. Next slide. There were so many events happening during Latino Heritage Month, including the annual Latina Empowerment Day presented by um, HOPE, España's Organized for Political Empowerment. I'd like to thank our LBCC employees that joined me at the event. It was uh, great getting to know everyone. Uh, the HOPE team also paid us a visit to discuss strengthening our partnership to professional development opportunities. I'm really excited about that collaboration. Next slide. It was great connecting with so many friends, like my sister, Councilman Mary Zendejas at the Latino Cultural Center in Mercado celebration at uh, Cesar Chavez Park. There was a ton of food, music, dance, art, and community. Um, I've served on this Latino Cultural Center and Mercado task force with um, a trustee, Mala Ulu, since its inception two years ago, and I was honored to also speak at that event. Next slide. I also attended Titchener Clinic's uh, family event and fundraiser here in Long Beach, where LBCC student and City of Long Beach ADA coordinator Jennifer Kumiyama was a featured singer. Uh, she has an incredible voice, and if you're not aware of uh, Titchener Clinic and the critical resources they provide for a differently abled community, I encourage you to uh, look them up because they do incredible work. Next slide. I was honored to have members of our LBCC team attend the Women's Shelter Long Beach Annual Gala with me. It was such a powerful event. And next slide, I was proud to be asked to provide the welcome. Uh, I appreciate all the work Women's Shelter Long Beach does, particularly as a partner to LBCC. Next slide. Actually, I'd like to move on from this slide uh, in interest of time. Uh, so the. The next slide should be the Filipino American celebration that we had yesterday it was incredible. Uh, I didn't take a lot of pictures, but I did want to highlight our student performers. They were so talented, and this picture is one of our students that not only sang two beautiful songs a cappella, but also played the guitar beautifully. Uh, these affinity celebrations are so important, and I'm incredibly proud of the work that we continue to do to uplift 
the beautifully diverse communities on campus. It provides us an opportunity for us to celebrate communities, but it also allows us to learn about other cultures and how to be strong allies. Um, we also must remember that being strong allies does not equate to lived experience. For those of us from the Black and Latino communities, we understand the delicate nature of the dynamics of Latino and Black communities. We have historically been pitted against each other to fight for resources. And I'm so um, proud that I have um, the partnership with my uh, colleagues to really address this. Um, I urge everyone to use words carefully. We cannot empower people to speak their truth or speak up against injustice and quickly undermine that voice and vilify the person. Honest communication is built on integrity and in the words of English writer Samuel Johnson, integrity without knowledge is weak and useless and knowledge without integrity is dangerous and dreadful. We need both. Um, there are a couple of items that I want to share with the community. Uh, I encourage everyone to consider purchasing the 2022-2023 Theater and Music Season Pass at LBCC. There's a great lineup of shows um, that our, our students uh, are putting together. The pass is only $50 and it really does help um, uh, uh, you know, our, our students and, and their um, uh, venture into, into arts. Um, and then lastly, I wanna thank uh, Summer Temple and John Morris for partnering to bring the community an autism night at the Boathouse on the Bay. That's which five, is five minutes. October 25th from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. All ages, abilities, and behaviors are welcome. Pre-purchase reservations are required. And that mm -hmm. is it. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll go now to Trustee Baxter for five minutes. Thank you, uh, President Intec. First of all, I wanna thank um, my uh, supporters for being here tonight, and I appreciate their participation. I'm, I'm gonna go with the slide. So Dario, you're doing great. Go ahead. No, no, that's great. This is a picture of um, college night that was offered by the city of Lakewood. And he, here is the Long Beach City College table. I'm so glad that they're there. And uh, last year they ran out of flyers. This year they had plenty of flyers and it worked out really, really well. And I didn't wanna disturb this girl because she was so busy talking to parents. Okay, next one, please. Oh, and then I wanted to talk about this. this is, on the left is Heather Allen, the, on the right is Maurice Roper. They are two war correspondents. Uh, correspondents. Heather is a journalist, and Maurice is a photojournalist. They gave a wonderful presentation on Tuesday. Um, the room was full, but I thought, oh, if only they had uh, taped this, because uh, Heather worked for Al Jazeera, and, um, and uh, Maurice was kind of a freelancer. They both covered war-torn tor countries, Iraq, Iran, uh, and uh, it was a very, very interesting program. Keep going, Dario. Happy birthday, Dario, by the way. And then here's a, a picture of us at the uh, uh, Mola Gala, uh, uh, which was uh, honoring George Pla among uh, uh, two other people, and it was wonderful to be there and to represent the college on October 15th, obviously. Is that the last one? No, no, here we go. There's the Labor Center. Um, I am so impressed, and I have to salute uh, uh, Trustee Balaulu, whose idea was to come up with the Labor Center, and uh, this first presentation was fantastic, well attended, and uh, I, you could see all five of us are there, and um, uh, it was very, very well done. Have I got another one? Okay, and then, uh, this is a picture from our Helping the Homeless Students, uh, and Al as Alex said, he was there. Uh, it was a wonderful success. Uh, I'm sure we made millions of dollars. No, I'm just joking, but we did very well. And um, today, with some of the proceeds, I went and bought gift cards, and that's what we do. We give grocery, gas, and, and, and um, I bought Subway gift cards today uh, for the students. So if a student needs help, if a student is hungry, we want to help them, and that's what our wonderful committee did and does, and I'm very, very proud of them, and I thank them for all that they do. And is that the end? That's the end. Okay, so then, on September 15th, John Smith, uh, we had a memorial for John Smith uh, on the, uh, the Labor Center. I got that already. Uh, on uh, uh, September 21st, Rotary Scholarship. Uh, I talked about that. I talked about that. Um, and, uh, 
October 12th, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Chip West. We had a candidates forum here uh, in T1200 featuring Rex Richardson and Susie Price and Megan Kerr and Ian Patton. It was very well received. We had over 150 people, and I am so glad Dr. West and Dr. Munoz agree to have people on campus is a really positive, positive thing, and it worked out great, and I want to thank them for that. Um, I also was at the ICT gala. Oh, and this was really great, and uh, Loy is not here, but Dr. Neshua, I attended the HR open house, and I have to tell you, I thought it was an open house. It was a panel discussion. I learned more about human resources than, not that, I won't say that I needed to know, but I was so glad I went there because I learned a great deal, and it was great, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Neshua for coming up with that. And then lastly, I want to adjourn the meeting in memory of four colleagues. Of course, first is Dr. Wendy Koenig. Secondly, Dr. Meg Westland, who was scholarship coordinator here for 20 years, a dear, dear friend. Her uh, memorial is on Monday. Uh, she had been dean of women at Cal State Long Beach, and I happened to meet her and found out her background. I said, ooh, you want to run the scholarship program? And she did a fabulous job, and, and we're going to miss her very, very much. Then Jan Quinn uh, Wyant, who, uh, whose memorial will be Saturday from 2 to 4 in the foyer of the auditorium, outstanding theater arts teacher. And then Blair D. Giovanni, who really hasn't gotten much uh, credit. She was an um, hourly um, classified person who worked in the, in the skills lab, the multi-purpose center, and uh, died very tragically also. And um, I, just want, <coughs> excuse me, I just wanted to reach out to her. And Doc, uh, President Tuck, thank you very much. And here's the list for you. Okay. Thank you. And if we can, we'll provide the correct spot. Oh, I got, I got 15 seconds. You got, you got a few more? That's okay. The most precious resource in the world is time. Um, thank you. We'll make sure we get the correct spelling to uh, Secretary Reese so that they'll be memorialized in the minutes. All right. I'll give my board report. A um, lot happening. Attended many of the events that were already mentioned uh, this evening. Uh, but one uh, item I want to speak to in particular, um, last week I took two days off of work and was part of an AACCJC um, peer review team of accreditation at Peralta Community College there in the Bay Area in Alameda County. It's a uh, four college district uh, who has been on uh, probation. And it's, um, you know, we've spent the last year and a half getting ready for our accreditation and, you know, we got the seven year extension this, this past um, June. But, you know, they did all the training, I did the ACCJ uh, certificate program and uh, participated with uh, colleagues from Santa Barbara, from Los Rios College in Sacramento, uh, Irvine Valley College. And it was um, very interesting. I mean, we get so much into our finances and our policies, but to look at another institution's policies, they had issues with uh, overspend, uh, with not having proper reserves. Um, they had board dynamics of not following ACCJ accreditation standards. Um, they brought, they have a interim superintendent president who's working remotely from Texas, which uh, creates just, uh, you think of the challenge that would be. And um, there was also some, a number of vacancies and it was very interesting, but they've done great work in addressing their issues. Um, they put people in, they've got the reports, they got a new accounting system. They had a FICMAT study, which is what happens when you near uh, receivership as far as not managing your finances. They've addressed all those issues. The board adopted a new uh, finance policy that has additional uh, transparency and public reporting uh, where they track the ratios to make sure they're on track. Interesting, they have a, we have a policy of 15% reserve. They have a policy of 10% reserve. Um, and it, it was interesting to see that, you know, we, we are not all the same up and down the state as far as policies and procedures. Uh, one item I, I did stand out, I think would potentially be good for us, um, you know, they, they did have uh, board conflicts in the past and uh, they've now turned over half their board. So they have a new board and they're really focused on uh, new trustee onboarding, but they have a, a statement of cooperation that they all signed together is on every board agenda and is, um, a reminder before meetings start that it's, uh, you know, personal tax are not welcome, name calling, that we're here for the student, that it's about policy, both at the state and federal level. Um, and it's um, something I'll, I'll, I have a copy of the document, I can, or a version of one of their documents that I'll circulate, but just a very uh, eye-opening experience. And also, you know, 
I want to thank uh, Dr. Kinder uh, Rio for inviting me to participate. And we're working on the report. It's not as long as the ISO report that we that we did for our institution. This is a, a follow-up peer review. Uh, but if there's an opportunity for others to be on a uh, an accreditation team or be able to participate, I know I was talking to Dr. Corral that it's really a great professional development opportunity, and I uh, just wanted to share. Uh, that experience that's happened last week and is ongoing for the next couple weeks. Uh, also, I do want to note that I got a message from Vice President Chico that she would also like to adjourn tonight in honor of Tito Uranga, uh, Roberto Uranga Jr., the Roberto the Uranga's son who passed away uh, from cancer also this, uh, about a week, week and a half ago. And we can add the list. Unfortunately, our, our adjournment and memorial list has been growing, uh, but we, we have Dr. Conant, we have Tito Uringa, we have four um, or three, three more members um, for Trustee Baxter to add to uh, our, our, um, our minutes tonight in, in memory of, and we'll get that spelling to you, Michelle, to get in the minutes. With that, we'll move on to um, next, is there, we did 15.1 uh, public comments on non-agenda items. Moving to section 16, we will not have a second closed session. 16.1, uh, so there will be no further uh, closed session meetings. Uh, we move to item 17, 17.1 is adjournment. The meeting of the Board of Trustees, the next meeting of the Board of Trustees will be held on November 9th, 2024. Closed session at 4.30, open session at 5.30. Uh, please join me in a moment of silence. Remember uh, all the work of, of Wendy and um, our other colleagues and Tito Uranga. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you, and this adjourns the regular meeting of the board. Have a good evening.